Hola. Hola. Okay. We're going to do this uh, one more time. Do you remember the Viva Penpot Fest? Okay. 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 So, Viva Penpot Fest. Viva Penpot Fest. Viva Penpot Fest. Thank you. All right, welcome to uh, the second day of uh, talks. Um, did you enjoy the Katamara experience uh, yesterday? Yeah. Oh, yes. So we have a shorter day today, and you know, at some point we have to put an end on things. Uh, so sorry, but yeah, then you have the weekend, OK? I think everyone wins. Um, we're going to start with a talk by myself. Uh, <laughs> I'm introducing myself. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm Pablo, Sierra Penpot, and I'm going to start with a uh, short keynote, actually. It's going to be uh, quite short. And then, of course, we will continue with uh, Dalai Felinto from Blender and the rest, the rest of the speakers. Um, I don't think there are any housekeeping rules uh, to share. Just, again, uh, make sure that you uh, honor the sacred rule, which is you're encouraged to cheer and applaud every time you feel so during uh, Penpot Fest, OK? <laughs> OK, let's do this. The state of pen pots and the rise of AI. So back in 2020, uh, you can see a shot there. That's from FOSDEM 2020, before, the, before lockdown. And you can see me there. And I was sharing this idea of this is happening. Pempot is happening. And if you were there in the audience, uh, you would remember that I said, perhaps you don't know this, but you're witnessing history, and you're part of that history. Okay? And back then, I, th I think some people could be ex ex skeptical, like, you know, what's happening? Okay, I'm saying today to you, attending the first Pempot Fest makes you special and you're part of the history, OK? Do you believe me now? Do you believe me now? OK. Let's see in three years you know, what we are able to achieve with you. And then, a couple of weeks ago, actually, I, I was posting this on the community space about the 400K users and growing, uh, particularly the interesting bit of the self-hosting, the, the private instances that people are using, because Penpot is a server. Is a, is a platform that you can use using your browser. Um, you can use our SaaS, or you can, can self-host Penpot. And this is a chart I want to show to you. Uh, there are like three, three bits there that need some explanation. So there is a dip there. <laughs> what is that dip? Some data collection was not working that day. And then um, you see a couple of spikes. So what you're seeing here is the rate at which every week we get anonymous telemetry from new self-host instances. So this is basically showing acceleration, because each week we get more new instances. Okay? And you can see a clear trend. Now, the two spikes, I think, are easy to, uh, to spot. And for me, it's easy to explain. The first one, uh, there was some acquisition going on last year. I don't know if you heard about that. It was uh, some big deal. And then the second one was Penpot exiting beta. So that is a very nice project. And again, this is the rate at which new instances are added. So the cumulative is massive. Now, I want to get a bit serious now, because we have a very strong ethos about why we do stuff, why we, we build Penpot. And I think uh, it is a moment where, as a, you know, as a keynote, uh, I have to send strong messages about some of the um, key principles that drive what we are doing, why we're doing this, for whom. So this is the standard, the proprietary format. And we say no to proprietary formats. We say yes to open standards and SVG and CSS. <laughs> and many other open standards. Some of them are ready to do design tokens, perhaps. Um, we say no to design and developer silos, silos, modes, whatever you want to call it. We say no to that. 
We say yes to welcoming developers to the design process. That's more. We say no to SaaS only. We say yes to SaaS, private cloud, hosting as a service, and desktop. Because we really want to build a deployment agnostic platform. So your rules. We say no to secrecy. We say yes to full transparency. And there you get a screenshot of our Tiger project. That's a current, uh, a current sprint for Pempo. You can see and know exactly what we're building real time. And then, of course, <laughs> we say no to closed and expensive. We say yes to open source and free forever. OK, so this uh, saying true to these principles uh, basically means that we don't take shortcuts. We don't take shortcuts. And uh, some people might believe that if you don't take shortcuts, you go slow. But that's not true. That's not true because if you see how fast we came from the alpha to exiting beta in just two years, it means that, no, actually, you, you could go fast. You can, be, you can stay true to your principles and, and, and still be fast, super fast, actually. By the way, nice picture from the team. And one of the reasons behind that speed is our secret sauce. And our secret sauce is that ratio that you see there. The core team is one to two, one designer per two developers. Far away from the, let's say, OK-ish, one to five, or the ind industry standard, one to 10. So I think if you really want to emulate some of the successes or the innovation that comes with Pempod, I invite you to try that one to two ratio, one designer per two developers. I don't know if that's like the golden ratio for product development, but it's a very good one for us. Now, of course, we, can, we cannot do this alone, even with that ratio. <laughs> yeah. And um, I want to mention this case study with Flex Layout, which came out uh, yeah, three months ago, right, when we exited in beta. Here we opened it as a, as a beta for the community to get feedback. And they so much improved what we were building. So it's both the ratio and then the bigger ratio, which is open core team and the community. It is you that actually bring a lot of innovation to the team. And it's the way we are going to continue to build new features, like grid layout. Grid layout will also have this open beta model. So you will be able to participate and give us feedback. And then the community, of course, gives a lot in return. These are just a couple of examples. Libraries and templates, really high quality content for you know, get you started using Pempod. We have dozens of high quality of those, design systems, libraries, templates. I'm using one for this presentation, which is the Pempod slides templates. <laughs> Actually, some people uh, during Pempod Fest we're using that one. I think it's super cool. You should try it. It's a very expensive piece of software just to you know, do presentations. Pempod, but you, you know, it's a, why not? Collateral effect. And then, of course, the translations. We have 32 la supported languages coming from the community. But, we, but you know, 32 pales in comparison with, I think, 300 languages, Perry said yesterday, just in Nigeria. So 32 is nothing compared to 300 languages in Nigeria alone. But still, you know, we're getting there. We're getting there. And also, we very much focus on bringing those uh, not so popular languages, because that also means uh, building an ex a truly accessible platform like Pempop. And then um, let's uh, just share this midterm roadmap. Actually, yesterday during the open session uh, with Carol and Andy, I'm sure you enjoy that, plugin architecture, token studio integration, and the Tiger Confluence were mentioned. But then I would like to uh, focus on the desktop offline mode, because this is one of the most requested features that we have. <laughs> and 
I would like to uh, shout out to uh, Corp's community member here, because he's done an amazing job in bringing Pempot to the desktop, using uh, desktop-oriented technology like Electron. But he's now working on a fully integrated desktop and Podman Docker container so that you can have the full Pempot experience within the desktop. And then what I like to call desktop as a server mode. I don't know if that's going to be a thing in the future. But basically, you have your desktop, and then you can connect with all, you know, you can allow people to connect to your desktop as a server using third party integration or your local network. I think it's very cool to have that. So this is, this is coming next. Do you like this desktop as a server? Just some feedback? OK. I don't know. It, is, uh, it could be a new trend. For uh, multi uh, operating system support, et cetera, et cetera. But then the short term brings us uh, components version two, you know, very much improved. <laughs> I see people like, yes, I need this. This is coming soon. Um, uh, they revamped UI, which is very cool. You get it, you know, like the, that's, that's a picture with a revamp UI. OK, let's do this. Thank you. And um, slicker, faster, you know, trendier. We will continue to evolve. This is really, really cool. And of course, great layout, great layout, great, 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 great. <laughs> uh, you uh, had a taste yesterday of a wonderful live demo by uh, Clara and Alonso. I mean, that was, that was amazing. OK. But then. <laughs> the, it's the state of Pempod and then the rise of AI. Because you cannot do a keynote these days without mentioning AI, but also because we are, we've been busy. We've been busy. So I think the key message here is that this is, this is a reality. Uh, it, is, it is a cool reality, but I think in the same way we, we strongly believe at Pempod that technology is not neutral, neither are we. And I think we have to take a stand as what, what AI we're bringing to the users and developers and the broader community. So I'm just a word of caution. I think it's not going to sound like that. People are not going to uh, say explicitly something like this. You will know when you are getting this type of message. So I think uh, it is time that we change the landscape. And we've been exploring some very cool open source AI challenges related to Pempod. And I want to share those, how we, what we are exploring, what are our ideas around how open source AI can be uh, exciting for both designers and developers using Pempod. Do you want to see that, what we've been exploring? Yeah, you want. So these are the five challenges that we've been working on. We have the design copilots. We have the UX to documentation generator. We have the design system advisor, the content generation, and one that we call, as a bonus, generative-based copilot. And I think I would like to thank Neurons Lab, a great partner that has been helping us uh, achieving uh, you know, some of these explorations. I'm going to share uh, three of them to you with some mock-ups, OK? So you get an idea. You get a taste. The first one would be the editing SVG. By the way, you saw the legend there, so you know that it is tough, right? The technology readiness, the risk, and complexity. We are very honest. We want to be very honest with you about what is the real state of the art. It is not ready yet. The highly structured data that is required is not ready. The current models that we have are not equipped to understand highly structured data, that convey behavior, logic, intent, they are not ready yet. But there are some short-term ideas that we wanted to explore. So this is the editing SVG, again, open standards. So this, you could go here, SVG editing, convert the ellipses into bubbles following the design trends, and then create linear gradients as a field parameter using the current colors, OK? And you will get that. OK? That's very nice. That's SVG editing. <laughs> yeah, the sacred rule. Uh, 
that gives me a bit of time to drink. This would be um, changing properties in the SVG components themselves. So SVG editing again. But now I want to redraw the selected icons in a field style while maintaining the aesthetics. OK, I get that. And then, OK, but now make the icons two-tone by keeping the current color and adding the color primary. And you're mentioning a variable that you have in your design system. And you get this. We're not going to judge whether this was a better idea or not. You know, this is what you wanted. You get it, OK? But we can move uh, and evolve this uh, so much. You have here a list of layers and components, and I want to create more components out of the design system I already have. So here with this app, I just select generic components. I want hover, pressed, focused, and disabled states for all of that. And then you get this, OK? This is, this is saving you a lot of time. Woo -hoo. <laughs> it, Things that we are exploring, OK? And then we have somewhere in between. And this is very dear to us because this connects uh, developers and designers in very exciting ways. This is a music app. You've seen this because we use it for a lot of demos. And what if we could generate the documentation? You know, as a designer, you're so happy with your design. You think it's, it's really neat. It has the interactions, the information that you need. But now, Guess the boring part. We need to write tech specs. We need to write user stories. We need to tell our developer peers you know, how to build this. Okay? But what if, what if we could just ask to generate that documentation, saving the boring bits for our fellow peers? Because I think open source AI and design is going to be about really, you know, not forcing me to do the boring part, but also helping all the team members not doing the boring part. So what if we could do this? And I get this, and this is real. This is a mock-up, but this is real. It is surprisingly ready to get great user stories, great tech specs out of designs using PenPod, including, uh, and then you would link it to Taiga, which is another, our other product, and you could have all the user stories there in your Kanban. So this is cool, right? That is, this is the type of AI that really, really drives developers and designers together. And then we could have more documentation, including flows, a really thoughtful relationship between the design and the tech specs. This is really exciting. You see flows, you see stories, everything. So, this is, I want to announce that this is all public now. Today, we're announcing that actually these are GitHub repositories that you can go and check and understand what we're exploring. We're sharing this. Remember when we said no secrecy, open source? We're sharing this with you today so that you get this is a different way of exploring AI. This is a way to explore AI with the community for the community. So those are the QR codes that will lead you to those GitHub repositories, and you will see all the information, the state of the art, documentation, and some bit of code to get you started. What do you think about this? Thank you.
All right. So now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dalai Felinto from Blender. Thank you so much, Dalai. Thank you so much, Pablo. Is the microphone on? Should I get on? Do you want you, to? No, 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 you do your thing. You know, I'm going to sit down and, and enjoy. Thanks so much for your talk. I'll watch it later. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for coming. It was hard for all of us. It was hard for me. I work at Blender nowadays as a product manager. Blender is an open source 3D software. Does anyone here do not know what Blender is? Don't be shy. Show of hands. All right. But okay, some people, not many. Um, who here uses Blender for their work or their studies, their artistic expressions? Okay. Some people in the audience. I won't really go over what is Blender, but we're going to be using Blender as a background to what we're going to be talking today, which is how do you handle design when you want to try to have the open, collaborative, all hands on board process? How do we keep a unified vision that's cohesive, that gives you a product, while also making sure we are not alienating the community? I'm going to be talking specifically about Blender, but I think a lot of these should apply to other open source projects or maybe even proprietary, soft, traditional uh, software. I started my professional journey as an architect. This is what I studied. I was actually already falling in love for set design. The turnaround is very quick. You get to design something, you get to see it. I was then familiar with the traditional vectorial applications from CorelDRAW, Adobe Illustrator, and of course, Inkscape. You can see on top some of the projects I did while as an intern, but using Inkscape for those vectorial arts and print is massive. I quickly moved um, from someone using those designing tools, 2D or 3D, to someone trying to create them. So as a developer, self-thought developer, I started to work with artists. I had great artists that I was collaborating with that were, for me was always inspiring to add more and more to what they could do with the tools they had at their disposal. And in that sense, open source was just a match made in heaven. And more recently, I transitioned towards product management, which sits in Blender uh, in between product design and product uh, as a whole. So I work a lot of communication, uh, design, and now and then I get to work with the developers, and artists as well. So it's a bit of a combination of what I have been doing so far. So let's <laughs> start with the basics. People might have different definitions of what is and what is not design. At Blender, we have this very specific understanding that design is kind of sits between the traditional UI UX from the user, user interface, the flows, the usability, but also with the, engin the engineering. This is a definition I got from Tom, Tom Rosendahl, the chairman of uh, the Blender Foundation, creator of Blender. And for me, as an architect, that resonated right away. As an architect, you are combining the experience from the clients or the public as a whole, the design that might be helping with the facade, in the furnitures, and the engineering requirements. So it's a different than a design that is trained in maybe industrial design or graphic design, but it's a kind of a discipline that's going to be traversing different domains. What does it mean in practice? So when you do design at Blender, we are prone maybe to go a bit technical sometimes. So we do treat the data model, data representation as part of the design. This, for example, is when we are exploring view layers and collections back in 2017, 2016. And we had this understanding of what is the Blender file, the Blender database, and we wanted to show uh, users a different way to, for them to explore and visualize their data. This is what we have in Blender since this is so-called collections, but then we're trying to find a good metaphor, a good mental model. If you have a good met uh, metaphor that you can use to explain, people can use that to teach others to make sense of what you're building. It doesn't matter how abstract the underlying data structure and implementation is. So really try to think like high level, big concept. Design can also be, again, in our case, but a high level concept even before talking about data and mental models, like 
We have in Blender assets, so components, blocks, goes by different names in different places. An asset was defined by Tom as well, as an asset is a data block. So data blocks in Blender are the objects, materials, textures. A data block with meaning. The developers know, oh, meaning that we are talking about metadata, more information. But for the users, for the artists, that's OK. I'm adding some meaning to a data block. That means I'm not creating an asset. I'm taking an existing data block and aggregating more data into it. So that gets to inform a lot of decisions also for development. We don't want to export a data block as an asset. What does that mean? How do you aggregate meaning to that? And then we can see that when talking to people about this, we reused the mental model we already established when it comes to the Blender database and where their data is, and try on top of that to build what is an asset. So you have the asset. Those are your assets. How do you see them? Whatever is the metadata. A part of uh, creating design and collaborating in the design process is communication, right? Communication, communication, communication. We deploy a system in Blender, sometimes, not always, that I like to call A4 design. is a ripoff from the Toyota A3 method. Toyota is known for revolutionary how the collaboration happens in the ground floor of the, the floor plan and how we can have in one piece of document everything you need to know about a certain project. So you can just go around rallying stakeholders, up management, people actually working on the problems you are trying to solve. And then you can, with this whole condensed information, convey everything you need. At Blender, we have a problem which is time scarcity, of, especially of stakeholders. It's very unique to Blender. No, I'm pretty sure it's a common problem. And oftentimes, we would create a whole elaborated presentation with 20 slides to get to a specific high-level concept we thought of. But usually, you'd lose the stakeholders in the second slide because there's something else that goes in a tangent. So we learned that this is also a pretty good exercise of uh, being concise in syntax, syntax, to try to have this one page that you can just sit with anyone. You can post on Twitter. And it's OK, this is the big picture, bird's eye view, all the way to specifics. That's actually it turned out to be really uh, effective for us, again, for communication. But this, le uh, this kind of high level design is usually sitting in what we call strategic, in the strategic parts of our projects. So when you are defining new projects, when you are defining new uh, areas of Blender, of the market that we want Blender to, to explore. But Blender, we try to have things that are strategic, tactical, and operational. Without getting much into that, this is army lingo that I think coaches kind of took over and used this for uh, explaining how organizations can try to assign different roles and responsibilities. And although we do have it's still a centralized vision for Blender and Blender as a product, and the Blender Foundation and the Institute, basically the headquarters and the team we have in Amsterdam are the most, not the only, but the most responsible for that. We do have a whole organic flow of the rest of the organization where we have the more online presence. So we have the modules, which are the different parts of Blender that people can join, and they are more autonomous. So this is where Tactical leaves. So we have this big picture, but then we have these approved designs. But then how do you go about doing that? We also have what's called operational, which goes from bug fixing to basically helping with communication and small day-to-day -day things that, don't, that are already, I would say, pre-approved. But you don't have a very hierarchical structure. Pre-approved just means if you want to start contributing to a project, this is uh, uh, the place with less friction. But across all of this structure, in the end of the day, we do have teams, basically, and we do have projects. Because it doesn't matter how we try to slice and organize the different parts of Blender, some of the problems we need to solve, they're pretty much like horizontal or vertical to the entire domain uh, we try to portray. This is an example for the Geometry Nodes project. 
some might know, is the procedural modeling for Blender. At the time, we are transitioning from having single developers working in a project to try to have, um, let's say, all the capacities that you need to implement and be autonomous to solve that problem within the team structure. So we did have Jack, which is who started that project as a lead developer, other developers. Hans, at the time, Sebastian, this was more a rotating seat. We had me like debuting as a product owner, product manager, was my first uh, attempt at that. And then we had two people playing the role of designers. One is uh, Pablo, who is here with us, Pablo Vasquez, helping uh, responsible for the testing and the whole UI and usability flow. And then we have a artist who is very special, like Simon Thoms. He's a great procedural artist. And we wanted him working closely with us, make sure that we had all the use cases grounded on the specific needs he had. And of course, stakeholders and Irun who was helping the, let's say, the how we do the thing we're trying to do, so the Scrum process. And although we were new at trying working with teams, we, this is back in 2020, we didn't have that many projects run by multiple people. This is still very aligned to something we always had at Blender, which is this product, Blender, the blender.org project at the core of what you do, and two different groups which are built to support this project as a whole. One is the institute, where I'm employed, which is responsible for the development of the software and coordinate the online collaboration. But we do have like the center part. And we have the studio, who is in the headquarters. It's half and half. Half of the people working there are developers. Half of them are artists, not designers doing usability and UI, but artists using Blender to make in open movie projects. And they are required to use the latest Blender. It's a blessing and a curse. But they also believe on the mission of being involved in creating the tools they needed themselves to make art. As an example, and this is, this is from the 2022, we had Jacques and Hans, which I mentioned previously, coming from America, Germany and America, respectively, because they work for the institute, for the foundation, or for the institute, but work remotely. But we do have this old-fashioned headquarters because even though we do have a lot of remote work, we also benefit a lot from having face-to-face. -face. And then you see uh, Simon and me basically on Simon's office where he works, just discussing whatever we were discussing at the time. I think it was whatever it was. That still doesn't mean or we still work with the community, though. So working with a team in like self-contained sprints is very convenient, gets you fast far very fast, but we are not, as Tom always like to say, we are not a software company. We are an open source project, first and foremost. And we do have this concept of stakeholders. So the same way I have Zimon working with us, delivering us use cases and helping to testing the tools, we have someone like Daniel Bystead, great, great modeling artist, character designer, his portfolio, You've seen his work, I'm pretty sure. Someone who at some point wrote to us, hey, I would like to be involved. This is my, some of the projects I did. I would love to contribute to some of those files as a creative common. So one of those non-pretentious files was what became the Blender 2.8 splash screen, and later the Blender 3.3 splash screen, I think. And we recently did the hair project in Blender. We changed how we do project uh, hair. And Daniel was the pivot uh, stakeholder when it comes to what are the features we needed, which use cases we needed to, to convey. However, it's different to have people that you cannot rely in terms of office hours, and you cannot tell them exactly what to do, than to have a design team on board. So we, we still embrace having the design as part of the, uh, our team, in, and that allows us to work similar to how Pimpot does with a dual track development. That's something from Jeff Patton, which means we do have the development with their sprints and their 
let's say, to-do tasks. But then we also know that at some point in one week, maybe two weeks, we're going to need a design for that feature we might going to work down. And you don't want to, anyone to be blocked. You want people just to keep working. So we do have a separate, let's go, development track. In our case, it's in the same track. So the same board that has the development tickets also has the design tickets. And then we make sure they are time, time, time blocked. And we make sure that the core of these, we're done, the most half part of what you're building is done by the internal team. Just because otherwise, we cannot predict when things are going to be ready. As an example, uh, this is the first use case we had for geometry nodes. And I think Andy mentioned that yesterday in the Pempot roadmap talk. Blender, at Blender, we're really good at saying no to use cases, no to uh, basically, like, let's say, personas which you cannot afford to prioritize, to contemplate. So in this case, we knew that at first we wanted to be able to do set dressing. That means we're going to have like 20 nodes that would allow us to do better set dressing. No, that means you'd have maybe five, maybe 10 nodes. And if you can do one, two things good enough, and we can document this to people, again, communication, we are comfortable publishing these with Blender and having these already as a product, early to market, people can test and can iterate on it. Another example of using design in our process, this is a more traditional comparison, you know, different variants. Uh, I love that having a whiteboard, is the, usually my main approach for Penpot, by the way, allow us to even go horizontal and vertical, so we can have variations on that end, but this maybe can have variations of variations. This is a recent, this is a thing from two weeks ago. We're using Penpot to compare different options to how to visualize um, panels and notes. Interesting thing you can see here that we're doing is called wireframe mockups. And for the same project, but a different part of this, we're doing we call pixel perfect mockups. Because in this case here, we wanted people to understand exactly how the experience was going to be with the feature. On the wireframe case, we wanted to make sure people are not distracted by anything that we knew wasn't fully defined, like which buttons do we have, what is the padding, what is the color, no. So it's interesting also to leverage when to use, a, how to use design as a communication element as well, to know what you want to get from each part of the conversation. But the same way a project might require this big picture design uh, when it comes to our top bottom big uh, project approach, we also encourage sometimes the teams themselves to come up with projects. But that means now the teams are responsible for big picture, big narrative of design. So this is also a recent example we did with Penpot as well, where because for geometry nodes, we wanted to do node-based brushes. And Blender had a very outdated brush management system. We said, you know what, let's improve the brush management. And then what is the story there? What is in the brush system? What is not? What is the draft? These are online. You can see the specific stories. But here we're using also the design as this narrative structure, like a bit of storytelling. But if you're honest, design is something that's present in everything we do throughout every little task we have to work on. So a couple of days ago, days ago, I think two weeks, one week, we were trying to address a different way to handle forward compatibility, meaning what happens if you are using the Blender 4, you save a file, and you open in, on, in an older Blender. You might know that if you save, you should know that if you save your file, you might lose some data. And then, okay, let's throw a uh, pop-up. And then I went downstairs to talk to Andy again, the, the artist in the studio. And Andy, don't do a pop-up, please. Pop-ups, just ignore them. I cancel them. Um, you also have a, a, a premise in Blender to never do like options to avoid options like the plague. So it's not an option to you can choose whether or not you want pop-up. So. So we say, okay, let's do like a permanent warning. This is the whiteboard I have in front of my desk. So I could draft something there, bring people over, mention to Pablo. But still, we want to post this online, to talk to people, to be able to reiterate on it. And then once again, okay, quickly, let's take Penpot, have a screenshot of Blender on the background. And on top of this, let's add the UI elements. I think you can tell that something's changed 
from the original mockup to the pixel perfect uh, uh, mockup, which is part of what, what is gained by having the right tools for that part of the job. As you can see before, I only wanted the, the question, the exclamation mark, and then, you know what? I think if you use the language we have for something else there. So it's really interesting for us to be able to have those tools as part of the everyday development process available for everyone. Very briefly, because we're getting to a closure here, the place where community can help the most is with feedback. So while for design we try to not, we try to be uh, cohesive and have a unified vision, and we don't really believe, I don't really believe on design by committee much, even though when it comes to operation, there's a lot of design decisions that everyone are empowered to make. But if you really have a community of millions of users like Blender, we cannot really accommodate everyone to be sitting on the design table. It just doesn't scale. Penpot with 400,000 users. It falls into a similar scenario. So I mentioned uh, like stakeholders, like power users. But we do have two different approaches for feedback, passive and active. Passive is very simple. We, are, we go to where the conversation is. We know that Twitter is not an open source forum. We know YouTube is not an open source video sharing program. But this is where the conversation is. So you know what? We go there, hashtag Blender, hashtag uh, jump to nodes, B3D, jump to nodes. See what people are talking about. And that helps us to, to highlight like potential use cases we haven't thought of. Recently, we, had a, we developed a, what's called simulation nodes in Blender. You can do like particle simulation and a few crazy things. Before we worked on that, people were already posting workarounds to do this based on basically a hack. And it's beautiful because when it comes to product discovery, to, to try to find out what is that we could build and that's validated, people did this for you already. People know, already show that there is a need or a potential use for this. So you can just skip the whole prototyping phase and go straight to, straight to building at scale. We also do active uh, feedback with a specific, very specific framework. So we have our forum, it's called Blender Talk, Dev Talk. And we have, for example, for simulation nodes. So one very specific feature, otherwise people can go off rails. We have this feature here. Here are some sample files, by the way, that shows good practice. Please start with them. Have you tried the feature? What have you done with this? So we have this policy of show your art. Don't only talk about it. We want to make sure we are listening to people that is they, what they say is grounded on their specific needs and real needs. Um, tell me, so basically is tell me how we're using the tool, what you try to do, what you couldn't do because of a, there are some, show, uh, some blocking uh, problems, which workarounds you found, and what was a showstopper that you couldn't find a workaround. And if you had whatever new feature, what you could have done instead. We did this in two uh, recent examples. And we also have done in the past, we reached out to specific artists. In this case, Arendale, a fantastic procedural artist. Say, Arendale, I've seen this tutorial for a different software, someone doing a curved wall, procedurally with gates. Can you try to do this with geometry nodes? And please document the process. And he went there, did share the file, say, hey, I couldn't do this, this, and that, or this I couldn't do easily, but I did with this uh, other approach. And it's not that you're going to take this literally as, an imp as a just feature request, but that's, that definitely helps us to have a very specific frame of user stories we can build on top of. The last thing I want to talk about when it comes to design is that we do believe there's a difference between, I'm start here. <laughs> we do believe there is a difference when you're building something entirely new or when you're building something that millions of people use it already for established uh, pipeline. So in product and design literature, there's this concept of MVP. And pe different people have different definitions of this. I love the definition by Henrik Knibert, which you're trying to build something in interactively so that you get answers throughout the process. It's not about having final products that leads as, as steps in the assembly line, but it's about make sure 
you're getting something new every step of the way. However, there is fantastic concept, which I think is very real, about interac inter in interaction equity, which is how willing is your user to keep trying your product if the process gets frustrating over time. They go in a place, maybe this button didn't work, OK. They're still happy. It's a new, exciting functionality. They try something else. Oh, now it didn't work as well. Don't worry. Try tomorrow, and then tomorrow we have a new version. But then some of this pain never goes away. <laughs> so we try to find this balance. Um, for new products, new parts of Blender, we do try to be more, we can uh, like work with prototyping and try to be more innovative. But when it comes to existing fe features, I'm really wary about having people trying it before we have a more polished experience. So we do oftentimes would go over one of new functionality and just do a call a polish pass. Recently for the asset shelf, it's something that people, animators are gonna have to use it every day, replacing what they do already. I feel a bit a blender specific. But while the code is being reviewed, we are working on the polishing. So you're not polishing before it gets reviewed because it can be done in parallel. We don't want people to not use until it's polished. But actually I do. In this case I do want the animators to first try that when it's already feeling closer to the final experience. It's risky. You spend more time that maybe could have done a prototype, but animators are very specific <laughs> stakeholders. Uh, a different example is this snap polishing. So we did a new snap base in Blender recently. But this is just is a new feature within snapping. We just committed to, to main, to where the Blender code is, so people can try already. But then very quickly, also, OK, that let's go over a polishing stage where people can have a better experience from that. So um, I finished the main part of my talk. I can open for questions. But I do have a few bonus slides that is how showing a little bit how we use Penpot which I'd love to go through. And then if we have time, it's still open for questions. I think it's going to be it's good. So we use Penpot in Blender for everything that when it comes to design, or we try to at least, from a very traditional uh, you know, design work. At some point, we wanted to have some flyers for people working at Blender. We do have like, open it's like uh, some development positions are open. We do also look for, like by the way, front end and back end developer. If you know people, send them our way. We do use like Penpot for basically communication pieces to polish a design more than we need for our own design documents. But whenever something goes to the final blog that artists might read, it's so nice to have these nice, uh, good-looking uh, pieces of design. This is an interesting example of using different tools for the job. So that started as a whiteboard, old-fashioned whiteboard drawing how we wanted to show simulation nodes in a blog post. Do I have a laser? I do have a laser. No, yeah, I do have a laser. Basically, you have the whiteboard, and on its side, we have how it looks in Blender. But then I wanted to show in a more stylized way to go with the blog post. So I did this basic polygon convex hole, and I wanted to do a little bit chamfer, and Penpot doesn't have that, and it's fine. But Inkscape has it. So I took a screenshot, went to Inkscape. It's so nice. Just picked there the chamfer, copied the SVJ, went back to, to Penpot. I do miss a little bit being able to bring from Penpot to Inkscape with copy and paste. I don't know in which part of the equation it's missing, but it would be fantastic to have. With Blender as well, I presume, to be able to uh, paste SVJs. Also, with the example, we had two different colors for to show baked sequences in our timeline. One if the bake was valid, which was the high saturated pink. Another one if the bake was invalid. But that was a bit hard for people to tell apart. We had a low contrast. So it, you know what? Let's try to have strips. And then we went to Penpot, although Pablo and I, to try to find, OK, which angle do you want? What's the spacing that we want? Do we want it going uh, right or left? We end up going that way because we wanted to show that, hey, there's a, that's invalid, that's a problem. So instead of showing, hey, that's a progress. And it's, again, there are times that you want scrappy back of the napkin drawings. There are times you want a final uh, refined UI mockups. 
And then having this digital is just so powerful. Finally, because a lot of the use cases I mentioned, they are just replacing a desktop application, which is fine. But we recently, we often would also open the whiteboard and have the, this is Hans, by the way, have the developers also open the whiteboard on their end, and then we can, each one can navigate independently. You can point to things into the board. Um, I have a slide here just because Pablo insisted us to mention feature requests. I don't do feature requests for open source projects. No one should do that. <laughs> I do have a few pain points which I talked to the team already. I don't, I won't go over them, but I liked to have it here so I can look back in one year, two years, like, oh, this is all done already. It's fantastic. <laughs> uh, finally, because I wanted to understand the open part of Penpot, I was already in love with the product, but how do they handle, how do you handle community? How do you handle contributions? So, I had a bug reported in the past, but I reported a new one which I found, which was I wanted to distribute some elements equally in my file. And in Blender, we have a lot of padding included in our icons and everything else. So, you know, very reasonable expect, uh, expectation to have, if you ask me. And I got a reply very quickly. Thanks a lot. However, it was a classic reply that, ah, if you're not really sorry, come on. <laughs> Jokes aside, I talked to Andy, I think. Huh? Um, I said, OK, I got the point. I replied again, making my case again. I actually created an, an account on Figma for the first time just to see how they handle that. Dangerous precedence. And I did something which is very passive aggressive, which is, I said, you know what? I think it's a problem. I'm going to try to fix that. Um, the code that some people mentioned here is a little bit, it uh, doesn't follow a very standard language. They used a Lisp based language, which is a closure JS. And oh boy, <laughs> that looks so complicated. I, I couldn't make heads or tails of that. Uh, luckily, I have a, like a one hour crash course on YouTube. I'm willing to go all the way to the end. And then I managed to have two patches sent for review. It got revealed is in, I don't think it's in published, but it's in the development track. So I'd like to really uh, you know, thank Penpot for the care for the community, going over the bug tracking, fixing bugs, reviewing bug, uh, bug fixes and, and new features. So that's a big thank you for Penpot. <laughs> And I don't, do we have time? And thank you very much. As I said, no questions because I think it would be nice. But I'm going to be here the whole day. Coffee break, coffee break, yes, yes. <laughs> we'll see you back in uh, half past 10, so 30 minutes.
Okay, welcome back from the uh, coffee break. We'll have another one in uh, an hour or so before the panel. Uh, first, I think there's still one slot for the podcast, Sustain Open Source Design Podcast. Again, the QR 
code is there. This is one for the morning. So you want to get interviewed and then share uh, all the greatness of your open source contributions, project, et cetera. There's one, one pending slot. So you know, whoever wants it, we'll take it. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Vitika from GitLab. And he, she, he, she's going to you know, just uh, present a case study of how they're using Pempot at GitLab. Thank you so much, Vitika. Thanks, Pablo. <laughs> All right. I'm very sorry to scare everyone with this slide to begin with, like remi reminding people of waterfall. But um, I start, like, I want to start this story by touching upon what happened back in the 2000s. After the dot com bubble burst, the industry realized that there's a need to change the method in which they have been delivering the software because they needed to like, gain the trust back of the investors. They needed to prove that they can deliver value faster. And that meant that they had to get rid of the methodology that they have been like, using all along, which is waterfall, which kind of breaks the different phases in product development workflow, and e each uh, phase kind of pours into the next one and so on. And there was a need to move to something that was more iterative and agile. Now, the story didn't stop there. After some time, when um, the industry started to boom again, and um, like there, all the different verticals had so many different players um, coming up, and the competition got fierce with time. Deliverable and the way they delivered was not the only problem anymore. That was a good sound effect. Now they had to care about their creative output if they really wanted to stand out in the market. And to make that happen, it's really, it was very important that they kind of brought about a change in how they approached product development altogether and uh, how they looked at the environment within the culture within their organizations, how they fostered the collaboration happening among the teams. And therefore, like, they needed to make a shift from this factory-like setup that they had before to something of that of a studio. I'm Vitika, of course, and um, I'll be talking about how the different tools which are being built in the open, like PenPod and GitLab, are helping bringing about that transformation to the industry um, through the different channels that they are building into their product to facilitate the kind of communication that was not possible before. OK, a little about myself before I like, dive into the story. Um, the first chapter is pretty simple. I was born. I was asked to be a doctor. I lost interest. My parents were disappointed. Chapter two, I did not know what to do with my life next. Um, it was easy, easy to reject an option, but it was not easy to understand what is it that I was meant to be. So I experimented a lot and many experiments and many degrees later, I found myself working for a tech giant. The experience was such that I literally ended up Googling after a few months, what's the opposite of secrecy? <laughs> Open source popped up. I don't know how. My question wasn't very, like, it wasn't too good. But I thank my stars that it popped up. And it has been six years. I'm very intentional about only associating myself with uh, institutions, organizations, initiatives that are only open in nature. And today, I am this person who is out of office until the 7th of July and is a senior product designer with the pipeline security team at GitLab. So the analogy of factory versus studio, it's not something that, of course, I've come up with my, uh, of myself. Uh, it has been borrowed. It has been borrowed from an experiment that a Stanford professor once ran uh, in the university. Um, and what he did was he created two groups of four people each. And to each of those groups, he assigned the exact same task. To the group that he considered, uh, to the group that he named factory, what he ended up doing was uh, he gave each one of them like their separate desks, a pen and a paper, and made one of the team members a boss, and whispered the word productivity, efficiency, and uh, industrial revolution to them. 
Then he came to the second group and uh, he made sure that he's, he placed them like far away from the factory group. And this time he did things differently. He mentioned to them joy, create, fun, and the items that he gave them to work with was um, creative, like colorful markers, papers, pipe cleaners, which was very fascinating, and a few other like fancy little things. Um, and they were just like told to have fun and create. Now, the output of this whole experiment was supposed to be like those groups uh, coming to the crowd, like coming back to the crowd, and telling a story about how they like deliver the task. And in evidently, um, I mean, without a doubt, the factory team had a very boring story to tell compared to the studio team. The output of the factory team was consistent, yes, productive, yes. But the creative output was like, it was blah. And on the contrary, the studio had come up like with really innovative concepts, um, but their delivery was not so like not at par. So the lesson here was um, like each of these setups, they have some trade-off and we don't have to be like sticking to any one of them. In fact, it's all about finding the just right balance that works out for your organization. And the start conditions really matter. And by start conditions, I don't mean like the conditions that you set up before you even realize your organization because of course like to reset the start conditions, you won't restart your organization. You can do it any time, but it really matters like what is the environment that you're providing to, your, uh, to the people who are working in the team, um, and how is it that you are inspiring them, motivating them, and uh, sharing the task with them. Now, in 2021, I think around March, uh, Washington Post conducted this uh, survey, and I won't lie, this was like heavily influenced by the pandemic conditions. But the concerns that they covered through the survey, um, I would say they are valid nonetheless, because even though like, we are way past that phase, to maintain a single source of truth in communication, especially when it comes to the conversations that are related to making decisions, um, organizations, they still make sure that they are like, documenting everything on the tools that they're using. So it's not happening all in the meeting rooms and uh, they just want to make sure that whatever goes in uh, behind making those decisions, it's like well documented, it's available for everyone to look at. So collab the importance of collaborative technology, it hasn't gone away with the pandemic touch wood going away. Um, and one of the insights that they came up with was 74% uh, of the participants uh, in the survey, they said collaborative work management tools are very important to the success of innovation and team agility. Now, with this, what I want to show is uh, a few examples of how GitLab and PenPot are doing some very right things in this area. And, um, yeah, let's look at those examples. There might be some like some bias I would have uh, when it comes to like picking up the examples. Take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, but let's get started. So on the top, you would see there's a screenshot from something called the design management feature in GitLab. Before that was available to us, it was really difficult. It was very tricky to have a very focused, productive and uh, like discussion around the design proposals that we were working with because, I mean, no matter which tool you're using, you would easily relate to, the, uh, uh, relate to those common threads running so long that it becomes like, eventually it becomes really hard to manage. Um, so this has been really helpful in collaborating with the uh, overall team, like looping in everybody starting from the technical writer, the product manager, the developers on the team, and having a decent discussion. And uh, like documenting all of those discussions, there's version history available for uh, like every time you update the screenshot. And you don't have to like put something new all the time. You can just keep on updating that. Um, and you can also just go on resolving the threads. That means you don't have to go and update the description every single time you make slightest of change in the decisions. So yeah, it's working out great. And the next one is kind of my favorite because 
going back to my background, um, I did many things. Coding was not one of them. And I'm not very proud of it, but that, that's like, I'm, I'm not too good at it. I do dabble into some front-end MRs once, uh, once in a while, but I sympathize with the folks who have to review it. Um, yeah, and there's this option in the merge request page where you just, like, there's a button called View App. You click on it, it spins up an environment, and you can just go and test the uh, changes that the f feature branch is introducing uh, to the product. And I would, in fact, quickly show a GIF demonstrating that. Like, this made my life really simple, and it's the same with the rest of the designers. So it can be really daunting to, like, go to the code and figure out what's happening. But, like, now what you can do is you can just go to the uh, review app. You can log into the instance that opens up, and you can just go and test the feature. And now coming to the examples from PenPot, uh, having your, like, speaking on day two has its advantages. I was able to pull up so many amazing screenshots from the talks from yesterday. And um, inspect is definitely like one of those uh, features that I would want to touch upon. Like, it really kind of brings together uh, designers and developers on the team, helps them communicate in a, a single language. Um, and like comments and threads, yes, they are available on other products too. But what makes it really different for PenPod is that it's accessible to everybody, and that makes like all the difference. And with that, I really want to touch upon like how to bring about this transformation. Like, how can the teams that are working on developing these tools uh, can facilitate um, this change in culture on the teams that are actually using the tool? So let's start with dog fooding. Penpot hosts its design system on Penpot. GitLab develops GitLab on GitLab. And this has been really helpful for both these organizations to kind of uh, get into the shoes, align with the mental model of uh, the personas that be using their product, and um, like not just do a technical dog fooding of the product, but also a cultural dog fooding. So they, like, they make sure that the kind of uh, communication-related changes that they want to bring about in the teams that are using these tools uh, their own teams, their own organizations are conducive to such, uh, such changes. The next one is share widely and share often. And uh, even, though, like, even if a product or, or an organization is saying they're open, the openness means nothing if things are not discoverable to the world outside. So it takes like, an extra effort to make sure that what you are working on is visible to the world outside. And again, like the YouTube channels. And not just that, what uh, PenPod has been doing in this uh, PenPod Fest, like highlighting all the work, all the progress that they have been making, and uh, continuously like sharing them over Twitter, over other places. It's, it's a great step, because it allows the world outside to get a peek into what's happening inside. And that gives them an opportunity. That, that, gives, uh, that tells them that this is happening, and this is a good time when you can just go and, you know, Share your feedback around that. Coming to the third one, which is empower to contribute. Now, once in a while, I run workshops to train designers how to contribute to open source. And I try to be like really non-biased, but I'll be very frank. Their first choice is PenPot uh, as a project to make the contributions. And that's because. Um, how welcoming the contribution guidelines are. And it's really important, because we have to make sure that uh, the people that we are building for, each one of those personas, they have an opportunity to contribute to the product. It's really easy to set up code, uh, like development-related contribution guidelines, but it's not so easy to um, create a room for everybody uh, to be able to contribute to your product. And looking at how GitLab has been doing it, it's also very impressive because we have opportunities for translation, UX design, evangelism, project templates um, alongside development. And that takes some extra effort. And it's the extra length that these organizations have been going. Lastly, even though it might sound preachy, um, 
I want to say listen, listening to everyone is really important. And I mean, with experience, with time, we as designers, we often get, get this like, confidence that we have trained ourselves to be non-biased, but humans are inherently biased. And this uh, struggle, um, not struggle, but the effort to like, fight against your own biases, it should just never stop. And we recently made a big change to how we go about doing our foundational researches, so I just want to quote that example. So in GitLab, we work with jobs to be done because we just want to make sure that we are leaving enough room for innovation uh, in our researches and um, also in how we are doing customer inquiry. And for that, they requires, like, we require to do a foundational research to document those jobs to be done. We did it very differently this time. Usually what we do is we go take interviews, we come back, we document it, and then we lay it out on a mural board. But this time we thought, let's do it collaboratively. Let's do it with the users. So instead of just like um, recording the um, interview, we shared a presentation with them and gave them the edit access and use like subtle indicators uh, for the phases in the um, larger workflow where they feel that they are the primary executor or the secondary executor. And like we were also taking notes collaboratively, like if I'm typing something and I'm like casting my layer of bias over that, they had all the right to go and like edit that. And that worked out really well. The quality of the documented jobs to be done, uh, and, um, the jobs, they were very high. And at the same time, we just made sure that we are not you know, building things from the ideas that we have uh, kind of inculcated in our head over time. Um, and with that, one more example that I would want to include, but I don't have it on my slide, is something that Pablo mentioned in his presentation, the designer to developer ratio. That's also that kind of uh, brings about a big change in how a team delivers and how much a team uh, like cares about creating value for the users. And that being the end of my presentation, thank you. <laughs> Any questions?
Okay. All right, so uh, we now have a very special presentation. Um, as you know, Pempot, Pempot's mother company is Kaleidos. And Kaleidos actually started with an open source uh, project called Taiga. And now Taiga is undergoing a huge revamp. So no secrecy, but still a lot of hype. And to tell you a, a bit more about what we're doing as a sister project, we have Damila Moreno and Miriam Gonzalez, both from Taiga team. Please welcome them with a great applause. You know what? We should change the topic completely. Let's, yeah, let's take those 24 minutes from these good people and tell them everything about, everything about my renovation of my house. Let's talk about the fossils that I have to change, the switches, the tiles. I think it will be a better use of everybody's time. Don't you think? I think it will be. If everybody has something in the audience has something to say about it, they just have to send me a message to this phone number. So I'm going to wait a little bit. I think it would be like, I don't know in which world the shower should be on and something like that. I, I think it would be like, let's, let, me, let me see. I need to know okay. what people say. Okay. Let me, lend me a money. Okay. Give me a money. Yeah. No. I think it's, it's okay. okay. Nobody's objecting. Everybody agrees. So let's start. Okay. This is the plan of my house. And as you can see, we're going to start demolishing this wall, the fourth wall. No, we wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> it felt weird, didn't it? Having something to say and not being able to, and not because it's one not up to you to decide, but because you didn't have access to the place where the decision were being made. Well, this is what we intend to avoid in Taiga, because we believe that a tool for making decisions shouldn't leave anyone behind. And that's why making Taiga global, inclusive, and accessible is one of our design principles. Why this goal? For starters, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> um, making this a principle means that is not a way of achieving another goal. It has its own importance. At Taiga, we want to make the conversation a central piece of our business model and design process. Everyone involved in a project should be able to participate in their own terms and have a space to share ideas and collaborate. Before going ahead, this talk aims at the same thing. We'd like to offer a global, inclusive, and accessible presentation. So for those of you who are hearing impaired, or if my accent is difficult, you will find a transcription in this, uh, by using this QR code. You will find a description of the slides as well. So it's just a bit of accessibility that helps us all. <laughs> wow. Uh, nice. Guys. Guys. <laughs> Guys. <laughs> um, now, and now you may be wondering, who are we? And what is Taiga? Okay, about time you ask, guys, thank you. This is the conversation I'm talking about. <laughs> thank you. So, regarding the first question. I'm Miriam, Miriam Gonzalez. Uh, I'm one of the UX designers at uh, Taiga and also the product owner. And I'm Jamila, Chief Operating Officer at Kaleidos and Backend Developer at Taiga. To answer the second question, Taiga is an open source project management tool. Back in 2013, when Kaleidos was a consulting company, we needed a tool where we, have, we could have uh, relevant and fair conversations uh, for our projects. And I'm referring to everyone from customers expressing their needs to developers noting blocks, which happen, or sharing ideas, which also happen in an open environment. We wanted it to be open source, for sure, we wanted to work with agile methodologies, Scrum Kanban. 
and we wanted it to be beautiful, which was an unexpected request at that time. And yes, I'm looking at you, Jira. <laughs> and we searched everywhere. We didn't find what we were looking for, and so we built Taiga. Currently, we are working on the next generation of Taiga, where we bring those features and have innovation around lean methodologies and integration with Penpot. If you don't know what Penpot is, don't worry. No, you're okay. okay. <laughs> um, now, to sum up this introduction. In this talk, we'll get into detail about how we are building a platform for multifunctional teams where open conversation are encouraged as a means to create better products. Let me say this again. We want Taiga to be truly global, inclusive, and accessible. And this should ring a bell for those of you who appreciate how Penpot is bringing designers and developers into the same arena. OK. So let's start with the first part of the principle. Let's go global. To make Taiga global, we have to think of different needs depending on the user's location. First and foremost, it is crucial to have Taiga translated into different languages so the user can work in her language or the language of her team, for instance. Typically, this would mean a bunch of Western languages, especially English, because everyone speaks English, right? However, if you really want to go global, you have to open the catalog and add, for instance, right-to-left languages as well. And you have to know which languages you want to include from the very beginning during the design process, because it's not something that you can plug in at the last moment. Besides internationalization, we have to think of different localizations so the user may configure her date or timestamp formats, for instance, currency, depending on the platform, right? Um, depending on the user's country, or depending on her company security policies, she may be allowed to log in into a platform hosted in European data centers and let it manage her data, or she may be denied. So Taiga is offered as a cloud platform as well as an on-premise installation. Kind of a side note, because that would require a whole new talk. It's not easy to make it global for everyone in every corner of the world. On one hand, we don't know everything. And on the other hand, we don't know what we don't know. For this reason, it's so important to have open conversations with our communities. They come from different parts of the globe with tips and requests we couldn't have imagined. Now, in order to have relevant conversations with these motivated but also random people, we must share our product roadmap as well as our design and development process. And we have to provide with means for having this conversation. Luckily, these days, there are so many options to reach our communities. Um, one example of all these components working together is community-driven translations. Taiga is ready to have as many languages as they are, but we don't know that many languages. We, attention, we are not even native English speakers, although you barely notice. Ah. So, with the help of the community, and thanks to being open source, let's not forget that, Taiga can be translated into any language, so the user can work in the language of their choice. <clears throat> Here you can see like, just a selection of the languages that we have in Taiga, and we have so many more. OK. Um, up to this point, we have a platform that can be potentially used everywhere. However, we know that having a username and a password in a platform doesn't mean that the user can speak up. Some roles and some people are more vocal, and it gets difficult for others to participate in a project. Um, although Taiga cannot solve toxic conversations or relationships, 
it can offer a more inclusive scenario where everyone has a voice, which enables better collaboration. So I'm going to tell you like three ways where we try to make Taiga more inclusive. Um, first of all, we try to use gender neutral language. In English it's easy, <laughs> but in Spanish and other gender marked languages, it's a challenge. We have to find new expressions that feel natural, but are not too worthy to prevent our designers from wanting to retire because this sentence just don't fit no matter what. Um, this gender neutral decision has also a welcome side effect. Some folks react poorly to this inclusion because it's ideology and they don't want it. They just want to work as they always have, right? Okay, be my guest. Um, in, in Taiga, we also use estimations to trigger a more inclusive decision-making mechanism. All roles are expected and welcome at estimations, so not only developers set the deadlines, for instance. That way, you can spotlight the work of designers, often ignores in, pla in plannings. We, we all have lived that, and it's just bad for the project and the team morale. Um, another scenario where we can facilitate inclusion is in assignments. We've seen this a lot, this old-fashioned style where there is a manager managing the work of other people, and there could be a huge chasm between those groups in terms of transparency. A developer may know her task, only her task, and not know anything about the rest of the project. Instead, in Taiga, a user cannot be passively assigned to a story, a task, or whatever, unless he has access to all the stories and has the whole context. That said, in Taiga, we want to take a step further in building relevant and fair conversations between designers, developers, and managers. And now Miriam is going to tell us a little more about how we picture this collaboration. Yes. Let's do a little exercise of imagination. Imagine that you are a designer of a project. Uh, for some of you, um, maybe most of you, it won't be difficult at all. Uh, the product owner has created a series of stories on the Kanban, ready to start. Um, you have already finished your previous story, so you're ready to take a new one, you do so. You write the, the requirements of this new story, and maybe you have some questions, and you use the comment section to put some comments there, for, to ask for clarification. Improving the definition of the story, because all that improves the definition of the story. When everything is clear, wouldn't it be nice if you had access from Tiger to designing Pempot, and that automatically creates a board on Pempot with the story ID from Tiger and also a label with the title? Uh, both pages, uh, Pempot and Tiger, will be linked, making it easier to move, to navigate between the definition and the design. Nice, right? Um, let's Keep imagining. Let's picture another situation. You have put together some wireframes on Pempot, of course, and um, you need that the development team verify that the data treatment is consistent. So a backend developer, and maybe all of them, go to the wireframes and put some uh, comments there. That triggers two things. First, you get a notification, so you know that what's going on. And secondly, a uh, needs info tag is added to the story in Taiga, letting everyone involved know that there is an ongoing conversation. Um, maybe it was a blocking issue, and a manager wants to jump in to make a decision. So communication becomes more fluent. As a result of that, 
a small but key change was needed in you can continue your work. So you come back to Pemple, but this time to do the final designs. So you're there enjoying the flex layout and the grid, <laughs> and knowing that the pixel perfect is only an SVG file away. When finished, you label all those screens as ready. And that changed the status of the story in Taiga to one where a developer can pick it up and implement it. Cool. <laughs> that, all that could, could be very cool. In conclusion, in conclusion, all those tweaks will improve your workflow. You will be able to do almost all your job, all your work done in your main tool, Pempot. You won't have to switch switch context so often, and it's easier and more natural for the rest of participants to access the artifacts you are creating, and also to track progress. Uh, these are some examples of, of one, what it means for us at Kaleidos to focus on fair and relevant conversation for multidisciplinary teams. So all this being said, the most important question here to answer is, for the faucet. Come on, are you Hold for real? No. Because it's no. Pro but no. Okay, okay, okay. Oh. But Come on. Like, okay. <laughs> the most important question to answer is, what does it mean that Taiga is for all the people, for everyone? Well, it's not easy for us to answer these, que these questions. Uh, although we have advanced a few steps in recent years, we still have a long way to go in terms of accessibility. Our commitment to accessibility has not always been as strong as it is now. First, at first we, didn't, we weren't even fully aware of this need since people with disabilities already have their own tools, their own apps, right? we have not always taken into account the full spectrum that our potential users represent, that is almost everyone. However, thanks to activists that advo advocate, uh, that help like, explain why it's important, and also lots of continuous training, we keep incorporating accessibility needs into our mindset both for development and designers. The team takes ownership of this design principle. We have learned how to face many technical aspects, um, colors and contrasts, of course, but also other things such hierarchy, amount of data, focus, many things. But in the process, we have also unlearned uh, some prejudices, like the idea that an accessible design cannot be beautiful. So the cherry on top is that by making the app more accessible, we are making it better for all of our users, even the ones that didn't have accessibility needs to begin with. Uh, we are committed to creating a truly accessible product, and that's why we have integrating um, accessibility as a base criteria into the design of a story. It's not something we take care of at the end if we have time. No, it's, it's also in our definition of done. For us, a user story is not finished unless it can, at minimum, be handled uh, without using a mouse, and uh, the um, uh, screen reader experience is taken care of and is satisfactory. So let me show you an example of what it means for us uh, that. Well, on screen, you see <laughs> the Kanban of the next generation of Taiga. 
So this is the fun thing is that can you close the little notification. I'm going to close the little oh, notification sorry. here because mat matter most is n so needed. <laughs> well, <laughs> so fun fact is that it's the first time we show the new product that it is. This is the, the product in which we are working so hard. And we have so, so sneak peeks on our YouTube videos and our community, but not like this. So that's weird, but there she is. <laughs> I love her so much. <laughs> well, so I'm going to, this is how it goes. I'm going to move cars around. You see, you see my, uh, my mouse and with the drag and drop functionality. And this is me doing the, the exact same thing, but just with the keyboard. As you can see, I can change the status. I can change the, pri the priority like easily. Well. While doing this, if you were using a keyboard, you will hear all the needed information. Screen breather. Excuse me? A screen breather. A ah, I said, so, somehow today I miss up a keyboard from screen reader and I keep doing it and I don't know why. Like, okay, so if you were using a screen reader, you will hear uh, all the necessary information when needed. That means uh, tips for discovering and remembering how to use the functionality, key information about the story you took, the, such the ID and the title, mm, what else? And the position, no, yeah, the state of the card at all times, uh, it has been dropped, it is grabbed, everything. And also the position of the car, uh, present and future, no? while doing, when I'm doing, moving the cars around, present and future, uh, both the status and the um, priority. Uh, priority. The status and the priority. <laughs> so, well, um, this is, uh, as you can see, as you can see, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I went blank for a second. Okay. As you have seen, I can I can use the functionality with some comfort with the keyboard. For some people, it will be like more comfortable using with the with the with the keyboard. But I can also move around the kanban without having to go through like this, without having to go through each story, each interactive bit, if I don't want to, to make it easier. Uh, these, are, these are an example of what we mean at Kaleidos to focus on, no, sorry. This is, sorry, I went blank again, sorry. I'm okay, I'm okay, this is, this is, this is fine. Um, everything is burning around me. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I can like, <laughs> well, well, that, that is because we are trying to make a product that has a, the experience is as good with the keyboard and the screen reader as it is with the drag and drop and the mouse. And uh, well, so uh, to finish, look at the design, like, but don't look too closely because it's in alpha, capish? <laughs> well, when we look at it, we don't see the sacrifices that an accessible design is supposed to require. What we see is something that is beautiful, that is useful and intuitive that everybody can enjoy. Um, we have a few sets in front of us. Um, we, ha we want to implement shortcuts, uh, custom shortcuts. We want to make also themes 
a high contrast theme and also a dark theme that is something that everybody has all the time for it. <laughs> also, um, what else? A uh, skip link system. We want also to um, implement ways to help the user that sets the color for the rest of the team uh, to do it with the enough contrast ratio. So we have lots of ideas. But what we think is going to make a big, big difference is to offer alternative ways of doing everything, whether you use a mouse, keyboard, voice, <laughs> you name it. So um, we have also, all the all things is said, we have a lot to learn and a lot of things to do. We have uh, are now in the middle of an accessibility consultancy that is also a course. Um, remember that there are accessibility experts, and you can hire them, and they can help you boost your practice and your knowledge, and it's fantastic. So go there if you can. Um, we have planned to make a series of tests now that we have something more substantial. Uh, but the test won't be just only about accessibility. We have, to, we have to check if we are using images, colors, and illustrations that are culturally appropriate and they are universal enough for everybody to understand. We have to check that we are using the correct formats for hours and dates and much, much more since, since we plan to offer that many languages. And that is also or everything we have just told you, and we have just told you, is only possible if the entire team is committed to this goal. Uh, that means that includes business, management, design, and development. The efforts of one of these parties in isolation are of little use if they are not combined with the... I did it? You did it? Ah, sorry. No, no, ah, sure, yeah. No, it's not yet. No. <laughs> well, so <laughs> the efforts uh, oh yeah. So if they are not combined with the effort of the rest of the team. So we have a big challenge now. <laughs> we have a big challenge in front of us. Um, the thing is, every time we dive deeper into uh, the meaning of these words, accessible, inclusive, and global, it changes, it expands. The initial scope of this design principle a year ago was so much smaller than it is now. But we are so, that's overwhelming and that's beautiful at, at the same time. Um, it, will, uh, it will be a, a significant investment and hard work. Uh, it's already doing it, <laughs> but we are so proud to pursue these goals because we know it's worthwhile. At Kaleidos, we have lived through a developer-centric era when uh, design was an otherness. Now we cannot imagine a project without a design team in it, and one that have lots of decision-making power. In the same way, we hope that uh, quality is such inclusive and accessible stop being anotherness in software development and became the norm. And we are thrilled to see how it's already happening. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that... <laughs> <laughs>
No. <laughs> la hola. <laughs> so yeah, that will be all. That will be all. Thank you for your time and your attention. And thank you, Pempot, again to give us the opportunity to talk about our stuff in this. And thanks. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks, Will, for these slides. They were amazing. Yeah. And welcome to Kaleidos. Welcome, Will, to Kaleidos. <laughs> well, now, um, I know there are no time for questions. I know that. So if you have any questions about the presentation, you can come to talk to Miriam, myself, or any other of the Taiga team. We'll be super happy to talk to you about your common thoughts. If there are questions about the renovation, Please save them for later and proceed at your own risk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. All right. So before we have another coffee break, because we're gonna have enough of them, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome to stage Emilio Coppola. You know, if you were waiting for Godot, you now have Godot, and um, he's gonna talk about the gamble of proprietary software. Super on topic for a event such as Penpot Fest, right? Thank you. Thank you, Emilio. So thank you for waiting and waiting for Godot. And this is about the gamble of proprietary software. Uh, a little bit about me. You know, I started making indie games. Then you know, like I moved into web development. I, I have so, a YouTube channel. I do a lot of things, right? But mostly I've been doing being an open source advocate and been working on the Godot engine on the Godot Foundation as the executive director. Uh, but first, I want to know. How many of you know what the Godot engine is? Can you raise your hand? Oh, so it's pretty good. Like, I wasn't expecting, you know, like it's you know, a game engine, not exactly like uh, for making uh, you know, programs, but people use it to make everything, not only games, and that, that's amazing. Um, you can see here, like, the editor in action. You can do 2D, 3D stuff. Uh, you have like animation editor, like a code editor, shaders, visual shaders, everything you need. And you know, working on a tool like this is great, not like because of the tool that we're making, but because of what the people make with it. We have very talented people in the community who are making games, like this one, Usagi Shima, which is you know for like Android and iOS, and you know like. I would never be able to do this, but by making the engine, like people are able to do these sort of things, so it's great. There's also like this very popular game. If you play on the Steam Deck, you probably know which game this one is, like top of the charts all the time. And 
as I said before, like people are also making applications. Like you know, like they can make these thanks to having a game engine, but also the UI tools that we provide with Godot. So um, yeah, people are just amazing making things. So yeah, if you want to check it out, like just check it you know, on godotengine.org. But you know, it's I'm very happy when I'm in these places and I see that everybody is familiar with open source and everybody's using it, but. Not so long ago, it wasn't that common, I believe. Like, it wasn't so mainstream, let's say. So let's go back a little bit in time. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey, and I promise it makes sense. But I started making games when I was 12 years old using Game Maker. You know, I learned the basics of programming with it, and, you know, I loved it. Like, having the power to make something, like an idea, and to, to make it, it it's great. And I didn't think too much about the program that I used. You know, this was very obvious. Like, I need something to make games, so I use this. And um, it was the first software I bought. The first one I paid with my own money that I worked, like, uh, you know, like, worked as a 12-year-old, like, oh, I have money, I will use it on this. And uh, they promised that the license was forever. So I said, like, okay. If they promise that if you buy it once, you get all the updates, you know, this will be like the software I will use. Why do I need any more? So I started making games with my brother, who's a very great artist, and you know, we started doing well. We got some recognition. It was very you know, small games. We won some awards, and then suddenly we started making money with it, and you know, things were going great. And during that time, it was the rush of the indie games. Like right now, we, everybody knows uh, what uh, crowdfunding is, what early access is, all these kind of business models. By the time it was very new, so we said, like, okay, let's see, like, our popular game, like, let's try to make a Kickstarter to make it better and all that. Uh, and so we wanted to jump on that. And we did, right? Like, we did, uh, yeah, Kickstarter, let's get money to build this game. We were very excited. And we failed. Like, you know. It was a terrible campaign. Like now I view it again, and it's like uh, very bad. But the people who also managed the campaign for us, like that we were helping, they were later found out to be scammers. A whole thing. I don't want to talk about it. But you know, like we were not discouraged because we believed that you know we could do great things. So we said, let's try again. A new project, bigger idea. You know, more people on the team that we met along the way. And after many of those lessons. We got funded for making another game. And the problem with crowdfunding, if any of you have experienced it, is that it's very easy to promise things when you're writing a document. Yeah, we will have the game, and it will have this, and it will do that, and it will run on Windows, it will run on Linux, it will run on Mac, because I, I, you know, I, I want to run it everywhere, like, of course. So it's very easy to write it, but you know, the stretch goals are like, poison for that. And we were confident that we will be able to make it. We made already six games. We can make another one, right? Like, of course. N no. It wasn't that simple. You see, while all of this was happening, Game Maker wasn't Game Maker anymore. It was like sold to another company. Now it was GM Studio. And remember the license I bought? Well, it, it's it's... When, when you say forever in video games or like in software, it's never forever. There's always an end life with proprietary software. And for us, you know, like we realized that the license we had was, no use, it was not available anymore. And if we wanted to update, to export to these different platforms, uh, we needed to jump to the new version and, you know, Everything was behind a paywall. Do you want to do this? Buy this new addition, like this new DLC. You want to export for Mac? You have to buy this. You want to export for Linux? You have to buy that. And even while preparing the talk, I check on the website to see what the business model is now, and it's not even available to buy. You have to subscribe to it. So you're not even right in charge of that. And, you know, it's crazy that at this time I cannot even run the games that I built before because the software is not available anymore. But you know, it's fine. Like, we made 20K, we are rich, we can buy new software, of course. You know, like, we, we did it. And 
it was way more expensive than what it was before, but we paid it. And uh, after starting working on the new version, we realized that the main features of our game were not technically possible in the new engine. So the, some limitations that they implemented, I won't go too much into detail, but really contradicted the things that we wanted to make with the game. So we were in these situations where we had to compromise and say, like, OK, if we go with the older version, we can do it. But it, we are not going to be able to ship to Linux and Mac. If we go with the new version, we, can, we have to change the idea. And you know, it, it was a compromise that we had to pick. And you know, we had to adapt our product to the software, because you know, we promised all that, but the software was not able to do what we promised. And you know, I'm skipping many of the issues that, that we encountered. I don't want to go into details for, or for where those, but I'm sure that you all have experiences like this, uh, maybe with you know, very popular software. But um, the most limiting factor for us at that time was that we couldn't modify the source. And we needed to modify the source to make the game for our needs. And we got in touch with them. They said, no, like, good luck. Right, like uh, you can use another thing. Uh, Try to contact everyone we knew about it, but there was no way to modify it. There, there was no way. So, you know, at that point, we were fully dependent on that software. That was the only thing we knew how to make. And during the process of development, it was not realistic to swap. Right, when you learn something, swapping midway in a project is really risky. So, you know, time was running out and. Um, we noticed that we based everything on something that we didn't really own. We couldn't modify it to our needs. And yeah, we were very, very desperate at that time. Um, the experience was so stressful that it made us all in the studio quit game development after it. We ended up releasing the game. We made like the good on the promise for the funders. Everything was like we promised, but it wasn't a very good game. We had to, you know, struggle a lot to make it happen. And we had a lot of support from the community. And even if we got the money for the funding and all that, we had to invest extra money from our pocket to finish it. And you know, we we were basically like uh, very demotivated at that time. So I just said, okay. Let's go to web development. Let's you know make some money. Uh, forget about video games and all this problem. So I tried, like based on that experience of how horrible it was to depend on a company, and I know this is black. Okay, <laughs> uh, I knew that I had to start thinking more about what things I was using and of how I was picking the tools that I depended on, especially for a business, something like that. And that's when I discovered Godot, right? I, I was starting to make my own game engine, but it wasn't really like uh, good because I'm not the best programmer out there. And suddenly, out of nowhere, I found Godot. And you know, it was like everything that I wanted. And it gave me, again, the motivation to work on games. I was able to modify the source if I needed to. If I had something that I couldn't modify, I knew I could hire someone to do those changes for me. And I wasn't limited to like the platform, the license, or anything like that. It has everything I needed, you know, and everything free and open source. Like as you can see, like as I showed before, right? You don't even have to, to pay to export to different platforms or even use it in different platforms with different software. Like you need to maybe only run it on Windows or something like that. Right now, Godot, you can even run it on Android tablets, on Chromebooks, you know, that, which is very important for educational purposes and, and it, uh, institutions. Sorry, institutions. And you can even run it on the web. Um, so after falling in love again, you know, uh, and I thought, like, if I could go back in time and start using Godot earlier, maybe I didn't have to go to web development. Maybe I didn't have to, you know, give up on the dream of making games. And maybe I could be making games right now instead of, like, having to go through all that web development stage. So in 2018, I started making educational content on YouTube. And the first four videos I made, of course, how to move 
from Game Maker to Godot, which was my experience. And you know, I was still a bit salty, let's say. Um, but I got more involved with the community. I started making a few plugins, a few games, and I promoted it as much as I could. You know, and an amazing thing happened like recently, which actually like one of the developers of the most successful games in Godot like told me like he used my tutorials to also transition from Game Maker to Godot. So that I, f I call that a win, and I, I I would love to believe that this. You know, it's in part because of me, but of course, it's like the whole community who made this happen, right? But, you know, labels we use, like open, libre, free, they are for more than software. Like, they also impact the core of your business. And the core of your business, if it's based on something that you don't control, you can have unexpected uh, surprises along the way. And those can be completely devastating, like it happened to us. Um, and we see this time and time again, and we'll keep seeing it, right? Like maybe you had all your files on a Google service, and that's like not happening anymore. And what are you going to do, right? You have to suddenly find a, a different alternative. Maybe you were hosting all your files on a platform, and they start to use your art to create a new product that you'd never agreed to. Or you know maybe you were trying to get away as far as possible from Adobe, and something like this happens, right? Like it, it's it's always happening when you're basing all your work on something that is proprietary. So I, I want to encourage you to revisit the areas that your like potential risks are, and you might not find a perfect solution, but it's very good to know and understand like what things you really control and what things you really own, and what things you don't. And you can always help those projects be the thing that you want if they are not quite there yet. And many, things, many people think about open software or open source as being just like a programmer thing. But as we can see here with Penpot and with many other initiatives, like more and more time, like we need more people, more designers, communicators, copywriters, and everything in between. Like, if you want to contribute to make any of these tools better, I'm sure that they will appreciate whatever your expertise are. And if there isn't an alternative to something you're using or you used to work, um, it might not be here today, but surely tomorrow. Thank you. So any questions? You can find me also in the coffee break. I know people want to have some. <laughs> this might be a bit of a silly question, but wh why do you pronounce it Godot? Um, you know, the play, like the name is based on a play, uh, which is written, you know, in French, I believe. And everybody pronounces it differently. There's a whole debate how to pronounce it properly. But we like that everybody pronounces however they want. You now the, the game engine was founded in Argentina, and the founder pronounces it Godot. A lot of people from the you know native English speakers use Godot or any other kind of pronunciation. But it's however you feel like it. I see. Th thank you for indulging my quest question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, of course. Hello. Do you know for the published games with Godot, the ones that are, you keep tabs off, of how many of those get to customize Godot, and how many are using Godot off the shelf? Yeah, most of the indie games you find are Godot off the shelf. And probably if you see games that are big on the charts in Steam, they all have custom versions. Um, whenever they are making the game for any other platform and they want to be very specific in terms of like fixing it as I, as I had that issue before, right? Like it's usually bigger teams with maybe more than two, three people that have custom versions. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure. We don't have any telemetry to tell because we respect like the privacy of everyone like as much as we can. So we don't add anything like that. But as far as we know, all the bigger games in Steam are like a, a bit modified version of, of the engine.
Um, so you, you mentioned that there, there's a whole bunch of games that have uh, modified versions of Godot. Um, these are all open source, so that they, they have to publish their source, source codes, right? No, the license we use is MIT, so they, they can do. But most of these different versions of Godot, they end up pu pushing their changes to Godot itself. It's just that it takes us a long time right, to, to review, because there's so many reviews to do that, you know. But they, they can do whatever they want with it. That's why I, I'm like. Okay. So I, I actually have a, this is the actual question. Uh, the, um, some of the projects that I've worked on have done not just uh, passive review, but they've actually gone out into the, into the wider world and tried to pull changes back in. Uh, but it sounds like you're already swamped by uh, merge requests. Yeah, there's like 1,500 pull requests left to review. And if you check the GitHub, I think it's the biggest open source project on GitHub. And you know, there's a very big amount of requests of changes and, and issues. But yeah, whenever we have like a, a high profile game that comes out, you know, we try to get in touch with them, see what their issues were, how can we improve it. And most of those fixes that work for their game work for everybody's, so they end up being in Godot. But you know, it might take some time. We recently released Godot 4, which was a big rewrite of the rendering engine and other areas. And you know, making a game is maybe like four years kind of thing. So there's people that are still using older versions of the engine and people who are starting now with the new one. So it's always like maybe this issue will fix, right? Like the legacy version or like long-term support, and then the future games will fix the, the current versions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emilio. Uh, well, now we have uh, another break. Uh, how is the morning going? Good, huh? I think. By the way, have you seen those banners hanging off that kind of bridge? They look cool, eh? Don't don't forget to take pictures. You know, uh, there. Are, you know, we have Nextcloud, we have Fedora, we have GitLab, we have Inkscape, we have Blender, we have Pempod, we have Godot. We have Token Studio, we have Taiga, we have Open Source Community Africa, we have Sustain Open Source, and then we have uh, Open Source Design. So super cool. Uh, they're not for sale. We, <laughs> we, oh, so sorry, we're taking all that back to our offices in Madrid. So now, just enjoy uh, the last coffee break before we have lunch. Uh, then next, we will have the panel of, uh, on developer and design collaboration in the age of AI, moderated by Vitaly Friedman. So see you in uh, half an hour.
So, we are nearing the end of Pampot Fest. Oh, yeah, that's the, yeah. But there's still more food coming after. <laughs> I know you have empty stomachs. Uh, that's impossible here. So, well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the last uh, talk, or rather a panel. Uh, it's great to end uh, Pampot Fest with a, with a conversation, with an open conversation. 
And we have this topic about designer and developer collaboration in the age of AI. So we have Vitaly Friedman. Thank you very much for uh, coming. You know, it's a, a really an honor to have you here. And then we have Ivan Martinez, we have Errol Fox, and we have Pablo Vázquez. So I let you know, them introduce themselves, introduce the topic, and we're going to go and enjoy that last hour of uh, PimpleFest. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Pablo. Also, just from me, just very briefly, um, actually, I have to say that I remember, just, just very briefly, um, you don't have to, I mean, I know it's like sitting here, but I, I feel like standing for a moment. I just wanted to really applaud, like really applaud for your incredible efforts here. I have to tell a little story, a very short story. Uh, I was studying computer science in university in Germany uh, around, like now, that was a long time ago, it felt like 2003, 2004. And I remember spending a lot of time playing with Ubuntu and playing with GNOME and all the wonderful things. And I, had, I remember vividly this sense that I had when I was growing up back then, when I was studying computer science. Like, really this notion of, this is for me. Like, I kind of felt like this is for me. Like, I had this really strong feeling around open source and the time, and it was really, really incredible. And it was, you know, I went on and I did all these other things in my life, uh, you know, in web design, web development, accessibility, and sustainability, and all of that. And it's only now, and this is what I really felt, and we had a conversation with Pablo about that as well. It's only now when I actually, and in conversations yesterday, right, as well, um, when I feel this sense of community and open source again, that's incredible for me. I, I really, I don't know how to describe it, but it's like the feeling that you get, and it's really empowering in many ways. And I want you to have this feeling as well, because I, you contribute to it. You are the kind of the part of it. You're shaping it. I'm just coming in and enjoying it, right? That's not fair for me. And so that's just incredible. That's uh, really impressive. So I want to applaud for this incredible effort here. So thank you so much for making all of this happen. Right? And I'm very happy to have a wonderful panel today because we're talking, going to talk about AI. <laughs> Is anybody excited about AI? Hey. <laughs> Everything like this. there is not a single conversation that doesn't you know cover AI in some way. Uh, so let's talk about that and let's see how we can apply it to our work, to our products, to whatever it is that we actually be, um, are working on. And I'm very happy to have uh, wonderful speakers here with us. Uh, we have Ariel Fox. Ariel, hello. Hi. No, everybody. Oh. Hey. <laughs> right. Uh, so Ariel is a legend, uh, lead designer with 10 years of experience in companies and NGOs around the world, uh, doing very important work on some of the toughest humanitarian problems, um, including crisis response, democracy, and human rights, and coming from Bristol, great, well, greater Bristol area, to be precise, right, in the UK, and currently also product manager and senior designer at Simply Secure. Is that right? Oh, uh, no. we recently rebranded to Superbloom, but we're well known as Simply Secure, so we're making that transition from Simply Secure to Superbloom. Okay. We did it all openly, actually. Uh, the process of rebranding was done by uh, Open Design Committee. We blogged about it on our website, so if you want to, not about AI, <laughs> just something about openness, if you want to read about that, you can read about that on our website. Excellent, excellent, all right. Uh, we also have Ivan Martinez Toro with us, uh, product engineer working, oh, I mean. <laughs> right. Um, a product engineer working uh, with product designers, data scientists, and engineering teams, uh, also as a CTO on, on truck, a creator of private GPT, right? And spends, uh, spent a lot of his life between Arduino, native mobile development, VR, blockchain, and of course, AI. So it's like you just take it all in, don't you? Yeah, can't stop. <laughs> that's okay, that's, that's fair. And we also have Pablo with us. And Pablo is a lighting artist communication at Blender Institute, uh, right? Um, hosts a live show, a popular live show. Uh, yeah, I try to. I've been failing for the last couple of weeks. We've been busy. Uh, we're a small team, so sometimes we have to release a new version of the software. Sometimes we have to make YouTube videos. <laughs> so we get a pick. And yeah, it's going pretty well. Yeah. Excellent. So that's very exciting. Thank you. Um, we also have uh, Perry with us, but. Uh, the unfortunately, doesn't doesn't feel very well yet. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, so, but if you have any questions uh, about AI, please come to Perry as well. And also, a round of applause for Perry would be in order. <laughs> right. Right. 
Uh, so the way we're doing to do this is it's, you know, it's very friendly, informal environment. So everybody who's watching online, everybody who's sitting here now and uh, watching offline, watching offline, like enjoying this offline experience, I would say, uh, you're encouraged to participate. Uh, so we have some questions and topics that we want to discuss, but we will have time to open it up to you as well to bring your questions. So feel free to think about what bothers or excites you in the world of AI, and we'd love to have this conversation. Right? And I think that there is one thing that unites everyone here on stage. Do you know what that is? We are opinionated about AI. Right? <laughs> we have strong opinions about AI, so we really better get in. And I think, I, you know, essentially the panel, the topic of the panel is collaboration. Collaboration in the age of AI. But when I think about collaboration between designers, developers, and everybody else on the team, right, I often feel like actually the most difficult problems that we're dealing with as designers, as developers, as different team members, are usually people problems, right? Not tools problems, but people problems. And if I think about improving collaboration, we have to ask a question that I want to bring to maybe Ariel first. Uh, can we trust AI? I mean, if we want to improve collaboration with the help of AI, we better can trust it. And if we can trust it, to what degree? Such an interesting question. I can speak from a personal perspective that I do not yet trust AI. I think we all need to make our own individual decisions about whether we trust it or not. I think that it can definitely help us with a lot of people problems. And I do think the, the interesting word that you use in this question is trust. And to talk about the challenges that often happen between the collaboration that I've experienced between designer and developer uh, and everyone else that's involved in the process is usually that element of trust. So if AI can help designers and developers better understand the perspectives that they're bringing to tool creation, as well as including users and really um, not just the intricate and complex user needs that the users are aware of, but often the things that users are not aware of. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've unfortunately invited onto the panel the human rights person who, <laughs> who will uh, be like, whoa, 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 human rights uh, ev uh, against every question. But the, the thing about being a human rights-centered designer is that most people around the world are not aware of their complete human rights when they're interacting with technology. So as a human rights-centered designer, whether we're using AI to help with the collaboration of, of tools or whether we're using AI as a component of a tool that is used in a human rights scenario or a humanitarian crisis scenario, uh, the, the main thing that we need to consider is would AI know or can AI help users or designers or developers better understand what the human rights needs are within that case of designing that tool and playing around with a few of the tools. There's some things that they can maybe help with, but there's a lot that's missing. Um, so, yeah. That's... Yeah, I think that in many ways when we're thinking about AI, we always think like we need to feed the machine more data, just give it more data, 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 data everywhere. And at some point, at least this is how the feeling that I'm getting from conversations uh, and posts and all, like we, we almost embellish AI to the point that this is the super machine. We don't know how that works really, like how it makes decisions behind the scenes, but we created this super creature that is so much smarter, infinitely smarter than us, right? And that can solve all the problems in the world. But I'm wondering why we don't end up then solving the real problems, like healthcare. And I don't know, if this is a creature of such incredible intelligence, I'd really want to dive in. Well, that goes a little bit uh, philosophical in there. But it also goes to the point, like if we're actually diving into tooling, if we kind of have a sense of trust into AI. One thing that I have, which is a problem, I think, like if I ask AI to produce accessible color palettes, right? Uh, I didn't have a really great experience so far in getting to the point where I felt, oh, this is really exactly what I needed. So very often it will be okay, very often it will be maybe suboptimal, I would say. So it feels like very often you do have to go ahead and tweak, and you do have to go ahead and kind of create this at its manual overview and this layer of manual thing. And we often think about AI being a co-pilot, 
So maybe a question that I would probably ask at this point. It's not that I was supposed to run it, but maybe a question to Pablo. Do you feel like, you know, right now we're thinking about AI being our co-pilot. We are leading the train, the, the plane, whatever, and AI is a co-pilot. Going back to the trust issue again, do you think at some point we will be the co-pilots for AI instead? So AI will be driving us? Because right now, even accessibility, accessible color palettes, hmm, do you feel like at some point we'll be just sitting back and say, we don't have to do the work? I, we will be the co-pilots. I no. think so, and I think we should do it. So back to the trust question. I, I think we can totally trust AI. And don't quote me on this, but <laughs> I think you can trust AI. Because AI, right, it's, it's, it's not like a, the one thing that is right everywhere. AI uses a model. So as long as the model is like uh, as AI is fed with the proper model or you, you teach it the right things, it can just make up bad stuff out of it, right? Like, it, it, I think the trust comes from the process. So as long as whatever you feed to the AI is transparent, as long as the code is available to see, okay, what is going on under the hood, and as long as the tools are there to see and to, to be transparent enough, I, I don't see a reason why not to, to trust it. But <laughs> should we, we, I'm open to opinions, so please. Please go ahead, Ariel. <laughs> um, it's really interesting to hear you say that because I don't, I don't disagree, and I am very, I'm a very optimist, I'm a cautiously optimistic person. Uh, I was at a, another conference uh, this month, earlier this month, called RightsCon. RightsCon is uh, the, one of the main conferences alongside the Internet Freedom Festival for human rights activists and technology. And one of the conversations that I was involved with was whether or not AI, machine learning, a lot of these different kinds of technologies can accurately be trusted to make judgments about laws and human rights issues via technology that we do not yet have like human rights equity about. So if we do not yet have a society which is respecting of human rights globally, how can a tool, like would a tool mimic that inequality? And we had a long conversation with a lot of like gender-based violence advocates and people that are LGBT advocates like, how can these technologies coexist when we have a society which puts, you know, people that are fighting for our rights at risk? So, cautious. So, don't disagree. Yeah. I would love to see the, the world where we become co-pilots to, to having that support. But. but that's at the point where you start tweaking it, and then at some point you end up with, like, I mean, if you, okay, no, this is wrong. Okay, fix that. <laughs> okay, undo, undo, undo. And then go back to, uh, to feeding it more of whatever values uh, you have. Right. Yeah. Well, I think when we can actually look into tweaking and kind of going in that direction, I think it's, it's also interesting, like maybe kind of to, to root the conversation a little bit as well. I see as well that we, this is very surprising to me to see that we ended up in the world of 2023, right, where I see the rise of prompt engineers. I did not believe, like five years ago, I wouldn't believe that there is this notion of AI prompt engineer as a full-time job, right? I mean, I remember, like, if you look in, the, I don't know, a couple of years ago, there was this notion of Webpack, senior Webpack configurator as a full, you know, full job title, right? And then we're getting into this world of AI prompt engineering. And this is probably a good question to Ivan at this yeah. point, because I think that you also have very strong opinions on that. Yeah. Is it really it? Are we just getting... I mean, you see a lot of prompts. Like, everything is extended with the notion of AI with prompts, where we can describe what we want, and then we end up kind of getting what we want. Is it really it, or is it just a start? No, it's just a start. I, I don't think anyone is going to work as a full-time prompt engineer, to be honest. I, I don't see companies hiring prompt engineers. I think that's a reflection of um, there's, there's people and there's companies wanting to adopt this technology, and the technology is not there yet from a product perspective. I think that's the key of it. So there's, there's no design being applied to AI yet. And I think that's the problem. So, um, so we're saying that we need some special kind of profiler role that knows how to talk to the machine. That really makes no sense. Like, uh, you know, I've seen, like, I've been researching a little bit how people is actually using uh, this technology. And the people that really get most value out of it have, like, a doc 
sitting next to them with a lot of uh, these uh, magic spells, these prompts, that they copy and paste over and over again. And that's the way you get it to work. That's, in my opinion, a lack of, a lack of product, a lack of, lack of design. And I think, I think um, it's normal. I think it's, a, it's just a matter of um, how early we are. And uh, we want to adopt it super fast. But the thing is that uh, we're moving maybe too fast from the research phase, like where like, it was only uh, papers and, and research to the, to the product side of things. And, um, but I think it's super exciting to actually get it started. I, I really think, and that's why I'm, I'm super happy to be here, because uh, now is the time to start applying product design to, to AI. Right. And, um, and I think very soon we're going to be forgetting about this idea of prompt engineering, because I, for my, in my, my opinion, it makes no sense. Right. I kind of like this idea of really AI becoming kind of this invisible part of our experiences where we, I don't know, we drag stickier notes, we kind of we produce as a brainstorming session sticky notes on the canvas and then cluster it, make sense of it, create insights of that. Maybe that's, that's great, but it doesn't have to be like, please, uh, does anybody say please to ChatGPT? <laughs> I do. I do. Or like, dear ChatGPT, yeah, how are you doing today? Like, I saw people actually doing that and like having a conversation, it's just, I do that. But that makes uh, sense. Don't judge me. Go, going back to the previous point, like uh, on the trust and everything, like, um, something I wanted to share is that the little we know about how those models are trained, like do we know the data set that was used to, to train uh, OpenAI's GPT-4 or, or even um, Adobe uh, tools? We don't. So yeah, you better say hi and thank you because you don't know what's going on in there. And I think that's, that's for me, that's where we should be going. Like uh, trust is, uh, uh, to, to Pablo's point, is all about how that was trained. And um, the sooner we know the full data set that was used to train a model, the sooner we'll be able to trust it. Because that, that thing is not making magic. It's just that, you know, finding uh, patterns and going from there. So I think we will first need to know and then collaborate like, in an open source environment to create like, the right type of data set. So the, the AI really creates value within the boundaries. Right. You need to put the open in open AI. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> there, yeah. Uh, two two points. Uh, it, uh, I love op OpenAI, and one of the things that I really love seeing is Hugging Face. So Hugging Face with all their open repositories, right? That's what I want to see as like somebody that is really interested in. Okay, I really want to know the ins and outs of your privacy policies. Why you're building this AI? Um, I've been really interested and really impressed by the what do Google call it? The People Plus AI Guidebook, like the different guidance that they give about when to use AI, how to assess mm. whether or not a product should use AI, and that's been really great to see. As well as the open repository is fantastic. Um, but uh, on trust. It, um, there was a study done recently by, I can't remember the organization, but they talked to kids uh, under 12, and they asked them the question of, um, would you want a robot to be your friend? And they did this amazing study about like, what it means to trust AI and what it means to trust an automated robot. And it turns out that kids want certain roles to be done by robots and AI and not other roles. So the, one of the takeaways from that research was, if there is a role which is about care, uh, human care and interaction, they don't want robots to go near that interaction because it, it interferes with the human aspect of life. And if it's like service, like recommendations or like customer service to some extent that doesn't need more of a human element, kids were like, I would love a robot to be doing that for me. So it's a really interesting yeah, study interesting. to... Yeah. Look at that like, um, you know, as adults, sometimes we dig into the intellect. And sometimes when you ask a kid, do you want a robot friend? They're like, yes, no. And it's more kind of <laughs> authentic perspective. Yeah, but I think it's actually quite important that we, we kind of become a little bit more conscious, I guess, about where we want AI, where we don't want AI, where it's maybe more effective, where it's more, well, unhelpful, I would say. And now that we know that prompt engineering is maybe not the future, sorry for those of you who consider themselves to change a career to become a prompt <laughs> engineer, and maybe a question for Pablo. Uh, if prompt engineering is maybe not what we want in, as an AI application in most products, 
when we're looking into, again, collaboration between designers, developers, and teams in general in products, one of the really interesting features, I think, is documentation. Right? When you think about documenting components, when you think about documenting directions, um, that's a, like making sense or kind of creating insights out just a lot of data. That's a great application of AI. Right? Um, do you see any other applications or any other features or things that actually really belong in there? So this is where we want AI to be a part of our digital experiences or digital products. Any, any examples, maybe, or so? Um, well, I'm from Blender related to 3D. And there are many processes in 3D that are so tedious that I don't think anyone would uh, disagree <laughs> on some, uh, covering some aspects with AI. There is UV unwrapping. There is rigging. There is so many uh, areas that are prompt to human error that I think many people would agree to, like, yeah, please do it. You do it. Um, but the subset of AI that I'm most interested in is m machine learning. Because uh, there are processes that I've been doing for years, and I, I always press the same buttons, and presets are not enough <laughs> sometimes. So the machine learning aspect of AI to me is more interesting because it can build my own model. And I can share it with you. Hey, this is my model of doing things. So it's like a, like a tutorial on steroids. <laughs> you know, this is my way of doing, doing things. And then getting maybe you know, recommendations of how um, how to improve that, and maybe even sharing it. It's like so people could see, like, the, this, is, this is the process. I don't know even how to visualize an AI model, right? It's like four dimensional. It's, but yeah, it's like, this is, this is what I do, and compare it maybe with other people in the community to right. take over the tasks that I do repeatedly, and it could be optimized. Right. Ivan, maybe do you have like a, a wish list that you wish? every single product out there to have, or anything that you feel like, OK, this really belongs there. Or maybe any tedious yeah. experiences or tedious tasks that you keep doing manually over and over again. Because yeah. it feels like, like one part of where AI can really help is automation, yeah. like automating these tedious tasks. Yeah. I don't know about creativity. We may be sh I mean, we can yeah. talk about that. Right? But uh, automation, anywhere? Yeah, I think. I think um Actually, in the last seven years at, at OnTrack, I've been working at um, uh, building a copilot actually for, for this specific uh, use case, which is transportation. And uh, something I've learned is that um, it is us, the ones that need to be creative on how to um, use this technology. And uh, I don't see it as a full automation, but more like a copilot type of uh, role. But something I, I want to share and, uh, for, for all of us to be creative, because um, I think we're falling into the easy use cases. No? Like, this can create text. OK, let's give some uh, keys, and it will create the whole blog post for us. No? Like, this is super simple. But if you think about it, the interesting part is not reactive. It's proactive. So having the AI to actually help you before you ask for help, I think that's something super interesting. And I, I also i have worked a lot with machine learning models. Um, something I see, like for example, there's a use case which I would love to see soon, which is uh, on health. So I think we still have a reactive uh, approach to health. So we get sick and then we go to the doctor. No, um, Health needs to change completely. So we have the tools, we have uh, these machine learning models that can predict that you're going to get sick. And, and it's going to be better for you because at the end of the day, the way we treat our sickness is not good for our body. So you can actually prevent it. And uh, it's going to be good for society, even economically, because if you can, you can you know, save a lot of money on uh, social security and, uh, and uh, health in general if you anticipate. And you can help people really live a healthier life. No? I, have the, I think the key there is privacy again, because yeah, for that you need all the data of how your body is doing and uh, where are you going to send that data. So there's, that, there's a whole topic around privacy that I think, I think the models are there. Uh, the technology is quite advanced, but um, this whole topic of, okay, who's going to be managing my physical uh, you know, health data is, uh, is a topic itself. Okay, I think that Ariel, you have opinions on that? Uh, for sure. Um, when I think about this, I think about one of the technologies that have, has scared me in the humanitarian and human rights space, which is biometric, like identification capture as well. And while I totally agree that 
AI can definitely help with diagnosing and helping with that, it circumvents the, the necessity of that, those systems or the progress towards the necessity of those systems circumvents the rights to privacy, circumvents the, the rights that people should have. And the things that worry me are things to do with um, how discrimination might come into either models or decision-making processes. So like where countries might discriminate uh, against disabilities or impairments or against like different kinds of identities or if accidentally some kind of information is captured by healthcare which is then shared with the government and we don't trust our governments. So if the government, some, so say you're an LGBT person that has uh, sex with somebody that's the same sex as you and that gets recorded in your health data and then the government has access to your health data and you're, you live in, under a government where you're at risk of harm for being an identity. Your access then to essential health care puts you at risk through the systems. Right. So this is like where I'm like, absolutely in the best case scenarios, this will really help us, but where we need to still have the co-pilot process of making sure, okay, can we, <laughs> I didn't think I'd say this phrase here, can we trust our governments? Can we, you know, can we make sure that as designers we're making sure that, that the users are protected and when they hand over that kind of information or yeah. when we ask for that kind of thing right. or AI asks for it? Right. I think we're all um, kind of very excited, I guess, at this point to just add AI powered on anything, on everything, and that makes it feel more modern, more exciting, I guess. Uh, but then at the same time, there are also massive applications that come with it, right? So obviously. Uh, maybe also looking at the side of what is happening in our industry. I feel like we, I remember vividly when I used to be a web designer. Now this term doesn't really exist. You know, like, what, is, what do you mean web design? Like, what is that? Like, because we ended up, I mean, I'm, okay, I was a webmaster. Anybody was a webmaster back in the day? Okay, so I felt like I don't even know what this meant back then. Just do everything. It's like a full stack engineer slash designer with m magical capabilities, I guess. So, but then we moved. Like we really evolved in the industry, and then we ended up designers or web designers and web developers. That made sense for a while. Then we got to this world where we have front end designers, we have front end engineers, we have back end designers. Oh, that's weird. No, we don't. We have back end engineers, we have front end, we have DevOps, we have you know, all those things. And I feel like we're all really drifting apart so much that when we're looking into what we're doing, like we have designers now, and they are designers. Like designers, designers. Like, well, I think that many of us are tapping here and there, but I think like I've seen roles where you're just designers and you have developers and they don't necessarily have even the same vocabulary sometimes, right? And this is an issue, I think. And when we're talking about collaboration, right, I think that really bridging that gap has been something that we all have been working on in that industry for like the last 15 years or so. And I'm wondering, are we, how are we going to kind of bridge those roles? They seem to be so distinct at some point. I think like Penport being a very nice example of really this kind of coming together closely. But I'm wondering, can AI help us to really bridge that gap for good? This has been a topic on every, you know, a, a topic of a talk on every conference for the last 15 years. How do we make peace between designers and developers so they can work together? Can AI help us, Ariel? Yeah, for sure. You mentioned earlier the process of um, when you're doing synthesis work on design research, the clustering, can you make sense of this? And I think, I wonder how far we have to go before like the skills of the designer are fully trusted by like developers. There's always like a sort of question answer process I've found uh, when you present, here is what I've synthesized. And I do have, like I would in my work, invite developers to say, here's my research, here's audio um, files, here's post-its, here's all the different things. Use an AI tool to, or use the tools that feel comfortable to you to explore this, because I'm very pro 
any ways that the different functions across building products, building software products, open source products, enable like excitement. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. an AI tool helps developers go, okay, well, the ways in which I want to understand this research and these ways that you've uh, expressed design are through using these tools, I think that that's fantastic, like absolutely. But I think the, the point where I exercise caution is where we're making like the product decisions to take that. It's like the, the, the questions that we ask, so we've got this, what do we do with it? Do we need to edit it? Do we need to do something else with it to right. trust it? So. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, <laughs> Question for Pablo then, because you are, it seems to be of all of us, you've been most, most enthusiastic, I think, <laughs> about AI. Um, I, have, I want to challenge you a little, and maybe also everyone in the room as well. Um, I just had a conversation two weeks ago with a friend of mine. He said, why are we so obsessed with AI, actually? Because actually, when you think about this, are we going to the future where I mean, we are, as the interface designers, or, UX design, or designers in general, we're designing interfaces, right? But if we have AI, and AI is so smart, and so intelligent, so powerful, so knowledgeable, can we just tell it, you know, do the design for us? We won't even have interfaces. You go to ChatGPT, it answers all the questions. You don't need to have an interface for that. So it has all the right answers for us. Well, if they're right or not, that's a different conversation, right? Um, sometimes it isn't, right? But overall, where does it leave us, where we pay so much attention to filters, to navigation, to design patterns, to data grids with inline editing and all of that, right? Where we have to, we've got to spend so much time designing these beautiful experiences, right? But in the end, let's just ask the machine and it will give us an output. And if it's smart enough, then we won't even need our like, interface design in general. What's your take on this? Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that AI can come up with that many, uh, can, can come up with new things as easily as, as humans when presented with options. Um, the, for example, the Mid Journey or DALI, for example, they, they offer you uh, with four options, always. I, and, and that takes longer, that takes more time. That was a, a design decision that a human did Right. Because if, if you offer one, like if you ask, uh, make me a, a new logo for Penpot, and they give you one, and that would be fast. But in the design process, someone thought it's like, okay, instead of taking 10 seconds to, to give you one option, and they, uh, it's like, okay, let's take 40 seconds, but give four options, because that gives you, gives people the feeling that they have, they have an option, and they do. And they know which ones are good or bad, and the machine has to learn also from, from that process. So I don't think we can reach a point and end up with content of good taste that it's just the, just the one option, and that would be good from day one. There's right. always that learning process, because machines, I mean, they are artificial intelligence, and intelligence, like we are, we're born with very little one, right? We, are, we have to learn over time. And the same with, with machines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think also just, just one point on that, I think, which is also quite interesting is, I think that this is like, a, um, I think we often really kind of take, we, we have our input into the machine, then we get the output, and we do something with it, and then we reiterate, and we keep refining, keep refining. But there is no notion, very often at least, there is no notion of the, the whole life cycle of the development. So what I really liked about the very first talk yesterday, it was really insightful to me, this idea about the design knowledge graph, where we actually capture everything that has been done, right? We capture the versioning, we capture the history of design decisions made, uh, why they're made, and kind of what is happening under the hood. But of course, it, can be, it has to be not just design decisions, but also everything that's happening on the level of the project, the product, business decisions made, and so on. And I can imagine AI being an incredibly powerful tool for helping, let's say, a product team to make smarter decisions, like again, being a co-pilot, but not just for design, but kind of for this big, the whole product 
development, um, including the roadmap and everything else. So that's, I think, is really, really interesting. But that brings me to this point, where, which I have to bring up before I, we open this to you as well. Uh, there is this ongoing joke that's going around in the industry as well. Uh, US, America, very good in investments, startups, business, and all that. This is, this is the joke, right? This is how it goes. Um, China is very good in economy, like booming and all. Europe is very good at regulation, right? Which brings us to regulation, I think, which is also an important consideration to have. Like right now, we see um, in the UK, I believe, and also here in, um, in uh, Europe, uh, the Artificial Intelligence Act that is, might be changing quite a bit about how AI uh, is going to be used, and it's very restrictive. It's probably one of the, if, I'm not an expert on this, but from what I know, it's quite restrictive in, in the way of how it um, should be, um, how it will work in products, right? But at the same time, there is this fear that's coming mostly from US that, oh, if you now restrict AI, we will never find out the capacity, the magical power that is hidden behind it, right? And so to the point that I think that um, at some point there was a blog post, an open AI blog, where it was said, well, if the Artificial Intelligence Act comes into action in Europe, it might not be available in Europe after that, right? So this brings us to the wonderful new world of, you know, cookie prompts, right? And cookie prompts we have basically, you know, in many companies actually decided to just move away and not make a service unavailable in Europe because of GDPR protection. Well, it's not necessarily related to cookie prompts, but kind of the idea being, oh, GDPR is so complicated for US companies, so we are just going to pull out entirely to the point that we might not have some AI services available in Europe because, because the artificial intelligence like this is so complicated and restrictive. But we need regulation, right? The question is, do you think that we will end up in the world where some parts of the world will be heavily regulating and some parts will be like Wild West? Like this, of course, has incredible uh, implications on human rights. So I do have to ask you, Ariel, at this. Um, I think your first question was, does it need regulation? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think the... Will certain places become a Wild West? I, I guess in the in the sense where some citizens of some countries may not be comfortable with, say, uh, for, for example, a different example, which is like uh, cameras on your streets that record you and then that feeding certain databases. You, they're, they're, without regulation, you can't make informed choices. But I think the thing that's missing and the thing that's happening more regularly which we all as a design community need to engage in is how we as designers and developers sit at regulation tables. Yeah. And if this was, if I could like urge you to do a single thing, it would to become as interested in, in <laughs> dry regulation <laughs> documents as you possibly can be. Because this is, this is how we help regulation understand what it means to design tools. So it's the same with deceptive design, um, formerly known as like dark patterns, which is becoming more like they're involving the design community more in like how we regulate those things, which is fantastic. And I think we need to do the same thing with our own engagement with, with regulation. We can participate in that. I think we've been told as creatives or whatever that we can't participate in regulatory conversations and we should. Um, so yeah, talk to lawyers, read regulation documents, um, and get, get a seat at those tables so that it, the design of things can become port, important as part of the regulation. All right, excellent. So maybe then before we actually wrap it up and open it up for you, maybe just a quick word of wisdom. If we look at the bright future, somebody is going to watch this panel, uh, I don't know, five years from now, 10 years from now, thinking, what were they thinking? <laughs> like AI was everything and then it changed and it evolved and it became this other thing. So if you think about the future, like, I mean, I know this, like even two weeks is probably such a long period in AI world now. But if you think about the, you know, the world in five years, what would you love AI to become? Or how would you like it to influence our world? So maybe we can start with uh, you, Ivan. 
So I think um, I, when I look at AI, not only at this last bit of it, like with generative models, but like the whole machine learning, how it is evolving, like I see it is going to impact profoundly like the society, like the way we work, the way we interact. And um, I think we need to take a conscious decision as a society like to make sure that this remains open to the whole world. Like, because it can, it can make, it can make, like, you know, digitalization itself already created a gap in societies. I think this can create like a huge gap, like impossible to, to, to close. So I think we really need to, um, as was just mentioned, get involved into regulation. Like we cannot let people that don't get it, don't, don't understand it, uh, write the regulation. We need to be there. We need to participate. It is boring, but we need to, we need to be there. And I, I think um, I, I would look into a future where, where this uh, technology is, uh, is open, like the regulation forces this technology to be open and available for the whole society. I think that's, that's key. And also regulation should look into data sets, into the models themselves, and, uh, because I think it can have like, a very good impact on society, but it is also a very dangerous tool if we keep it close or only powerful uh, countries have access to it. To it. Okay. Pablo? Um. On a similar note, I think the, the future is AI in one way or another, and the future is open source. I, I can totally see ourselves looking, I don't know, 10 years, 20, 50 years from now, and looking back, and it's like, how did we, how wasn't AI open from day one? Like, really, right? Like, where, where were you, nuts? Like, how can you, like, how can you have these invisible models that no one knows what is fed to, and then just trust that process. Yeah, the future is, is open source for sure, because we are, at some point we're going to realize how silly it is that, <laughs> that we don't have access to see how things are done. Mm -hmm. And final word from Ariel. Uh, there's one current example that I think AI, that I'd like to see more hap happen. Uh, so one of the things that I saw happen in the creative artist community with DALI and Midjourney happen is suddenly artists and image creators wanted to have conversations about their, the openness, their rights. And I hadn't noticed that conversation happen until like as widely as it did. I can't remember the last time that that had happened. So I think that even though it's a very complicated issue, the rights and how you, the ownership of like creative materials, I think it was beautiful to see creatives engaging in, this is how I want to own, or this is how I want to share. And it's essentially conversations about licensing. And I was like, there are other people that have never done open source are having conversations about licensing. Fantastic, so, so <laughs> exciting. Um, and yeah, I think the future for AI is incredibly bright. Um, and yeah, more, more of those conversations and more of that openness, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, 100% um, uh, we should decentralize the AI from uh, the Western society. Absolutely, like it needs to be centralized in marginalized com communities, the global majority. Let's uh, make a collective decision as people that have been in power, the kind of white supremacist society, it needs to be centered in like communities that know what it's like to be oppressed by the, the prevalent society. So that's what I'd like to see happen. Excellent, right? From my end, maybe just to add a little bit on that. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know why, but recently I started thinking a lot about how I was, what it was like for me when I was in school. I know it's, it's a very strange talk, like what? Uh, and I think I, I really wish that there was something that I was taught in school, like taxes. Like, I wish somebody told me when I was like, I don't know, 10 years old, how tax systems work. And I wish somebody told me how to communicate better, right? So I know a few things about mathematics and uh, algebra and geometry, and that's, these are very useful skills. But I'm wondering now like, how AI is going to also reshape entirely how we are doing the schooling, like the actual education systems. Because now you can get an immediate, incredibly correct, with a high precision, very correct answer from AI. So maybe we could be doing slightly more creative things, because this is, this is, we can have a conversation about that. This is where I think AI is maybe not as good as people are. 
<laughs> I'm very happy to be challenged on that, right? So I'm very looking forward to these traditional industries, healthcare, education, being disrupted by AI. So I think that this is a good thing, right? Whew. All right, so do we have any questions in the room? Oh, we have some opinions in the back. Oh, okay, get ready. This, uh, this is going to be something. Um, so I have one question. How do you think AI will affect our quality in our profession? Like, how will it affect, like, how our code is written or our design is done? Looking back, like, 20 years, we had the shift in photography from analog to digital. Like, the f quality of photography really degraded. And everybody I know that's into analog photography takes way more time in spending and, like, gets more quality results out. But it's not a big bunch. So how do you see this effect? on AI in the future. Mm, anybody? I can answer on the technical side. Um, I like one of the, the teams at OnTrack uh, is the data team. And the data team came from a, not that technical background. They were data analysts. But they, they, their job is getting more and more technical every day. And, and for them, the, uh, like the ability to use AI to code, to actually write code, which is not code for production, it's code for analysis. So it is not like, you know, you need like the best engineer to actually write the most robust code. Um, but out of the sudden, they became way more performant because they could, they, they didn't have the, um, they didn't need to go to the engineering team to actually get things done when they had an idea. And uh, I think that applies to everything. I think we, we are lowering uh, entry barriers for, for people to actually try their ideas. And I, I love that, I love that part of it. Yeah. So I think from my end, when I look back as well, uh, I mean, I always feel like whenever we make technology more uh, accessible to people, good things happen. So one thing that I, I experience on my own is, you know, again, <laughs> looking back in, in the past all, the day, all day long today. So when I used to be a webmaster, right, I felt like many people around me who had no idea about HTML, who had no idea about the web, they could relatively quickly build a website. It wouldn't be a nice website. It would be probably using Perl and PHP and all these things. But it was relatively straightforward and easy. Now I feel like for people who I get to see when I'm talking about like students, right? Oh, web is not easy for them. Right? Web is not straightforward. I mean, obviously, you can go to plenty of generators of websites and click, you know, generate them with a button. But if you want to bring in some sort of your creativity, it's, you need to think about all those things that are kind of crushing you. Like, if you, if you think about like full stack development, like what, you, what is happening in the JavaScript side of things, what is happening in CSS, this is so much. So I think that if in some way, and this is what it seems like it, it's going to become, if we get AI to the point where we can say, produce code, semantic output, accessible output, accessible color schemes, uh, and, and so on, out of the box in some of those magical constructors, I think is a good thing. I don't think it's necessarily going to reduce the quality of um, code or designs. As long as it's accessible, mm -hmm. as long as somebody can quickly get to where they want to be, I'm perfectly fine with it, I would say. Maybe, yeah? Uh, I don't know. I'd love to give an example from a design perspective, if that's OK. Um, I don't know whether it's launched yet, so I might get in trouble for saying this if it's recorded. <laughs> um, so I'll be a bit vague. I saw an example recently. Um, there are, uh, I know somebody that works at an organization uh, that makes technology for people that only have use of their eyes for eye tracking software. And um, I saw the use of uh, creative AI tools enable people that have zero mobility, can't speak, communicate, to create art. And I sobbed like viscerally for, for a long time when I saw this use of AI technology enabling people to express themselves. So I think that this gives me tingles. Like yeah. this kind of AI gives me like hope for humans thinking this can make life better in, for these like, folks that have yeah. impairments. So that, I think, is how design can be improved like, yeah. process-wise. That's an interesting point, because I also saw an article where 
somebody who uh, wanted to become a composer, a music composer, for a long time. And it's always like a barrier. You have to learn, you have to understand and all. And all of a sudden, they could easily produce some relatively decent tunes and be so excited. And, and when I see the kind of the, just the, the smile that children have when they just click a couple of buttons and they have this remarkable result, that could be really great for teaching right, and learning and so on. So I'm very hopeful at this point. I think there was a question uh, in there. OK, first. hello. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I'm here. Uh, oh, yes, yes. So, any, yes. Uh, I'm uh, very inspired by one quote about design, which says, if you want to be a good designer, don't uh, study design, start, uh, like study uh, philosophy, uh, and, uh, well, uh, you're interested, uh, I forgot the whole quote, but uh, you touched the topic of education, and um, you say maybe uh, not studying like algebra and other things will permit us to be more creative. Uh, but my question is, um, can we be really creative if we don't study these uh, basic things like liter uh, literature and uh, algebra, MS and philosophy? Uh, can we do that? Oh, that's a very good question from, from my end. Uh, I didn't mean to dismiss the entire, uh, like the entire series of industries like literature and so on. Of course, this is a part. This needs to be a part of it. Um, and it's a very important part, right? Uh, it just, I wish there was actually more school for me. I mean, I know it sounds very strange now, but because back then I, I didn't even like school that much. But I think I wish there was more school stuff where we'd be learning all the different disciplines as well. Uh, anything from you? Well, yeah, like uh, I have uh, um, uh, two girls, like twins. They're turning ten years old now, and I, yeah, I, I really think we should keep the the basics. But then I I, I see them like uh, learning every small part of this uh, type of insects, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, maybe they could be using their time to actually learn critical thinking, for example. Critical thinking, yeah. Uh, which is something super important, or actually how to how to um, express their ideas, and then how to you know, have a, a debate and a discussion. I I do think we need to evolve a little bit in the in education. Yeah, I also have a strong opinion there, and I would love more schools of more types to be available. Um, you know, because there's also different types of education, and we should be able to choose. Right. Yeah. We should teach AI as well. Yeah. Like yeah. It's it should be I think in the future it should be like like knowing a bit of CSS, a bit of everybody should have at least some some knowledge about it because it is going to be everywhere and the only way to make it like democratic if we are all at least we know what's going on at the basic level. And because some aspects are never gonna change, right? Like human psychology, it's always there. Like if you're studying design Psychology is a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. I think with AI, also, it's going to be a huge part of it. We've got to learn it. OK, well, um, yes. If yeah. you have the human rights worker bingo card uh, and you're filling it out, I'm going to say another word where you can fill out your bingo card. So education is, uh, the Western world is colonial. It's incredibly colonial. Um, uh, one of my colleagues is from Vietnam and would talk a lot about how the design education in Vietnam uh, is 100% colonial from, from that era. And so I think that what you're touching on is like, where, what practices of design do we value under colonialism and how do we break out of like the colonial way of thinking and start to embrace what we could describe as like indigenous practices of a design and different ways than what we've been taught is the good way, which is like very Western European, US centric ways of doing design, which isn't, aren't the only ways of doing design uh, at all. Uh, so I think 100% agree with you. More access to all the ways globally that we approach design and lifting them up like above these colonial ways. Fantastic. I think there were a few more questions. Uh, in, in, oh, we have way more questions. Excellent. Thanks. Um, all right, so I'm going to ask a, a critical but, but friendly uh, question here. Um, so I think one 
one interesting aspect of the, the hype around AI is that it conveniently coincides with like a massive amount of financial investment in these technologies. I'm not saying we're all like hyped on it because like maybe we could be the next startup that gets you know $100 million from you know, Andreessen Horowitz or whatever. But uh, if we look at a lot of the early deployment of AI systems so far, a lot of them haven't necessarily matched our expectations of the sort of social good that we've seen. We've seen AI systems uh, increasing inequality through fraud detection systems and you know, public services. Uh, we've seen newsfeed algorithms uh, lead to uh, you know, genocide in countries like Burma. And so I'm curious about you know, a lot of this investment going into AI, the, the AI applications that might come out of that might not necessarily match our idealized versions of you know, maybe these different, more equitable applications. And when thinking about your positivity towards this technology, because obviously there are probably nice use cases out of it, how do you rectify it with the reality of what our current like, political and, and economic situations are towards investing in this technology? I think it's a perfect question for Pablo. <laughs> I'm also interested in hearing from uh, the team at uh, Kaleidos, actually, that work on, on the AI side of things that we saw today. Um, but yeah, can you uh, repeat the question? Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, so the, the question is basically when we're looking at the massive investments that are going into the world of oh. uh, AI, uh, many of them are not necessarily making a positive contribution to the society in which we're living. So while in many ways we're improving our collaboration, we're improving our efficiency, productivity with our tools, um, but at the same time, it actually has a lot of negative consequences as well in kind of the world, in the world that in which we're living. So the question is, we're looking at the enthusiasm that we prospect, and many people of course around us and the entire world prospects into AI. Can we justify it, given that the output of AI so far has not really helped society as a whole. I think it's too early to, to even see the outcome of, of that. And right now, I, I think we're totally on a bubble of AI and people investing and throwing money at AI because NFTs are no longer a thing, or 3D is no longer a thing. And I think it's, I think it's too, 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 too early. And the only way we could fix some of this was with regulation again and make it making sure that the, the way these tools are developed are, uh, are, are visual. Otherwise, everybody can come up with an AI model, and it's not really good, I think. OK, OK. Ariel, I think that you have also thoughts on that. I'm going to say like the shortest answer, and I think it won't surprise you. Ethical open source licenses? <laughs> it's controversial. <laughs> um, maybe. <laughs> Maybe that's maybe that is how we maybe we need to really consider what it means to ethically produce uh, technology and engage with it. Um, I even though regulation exists for a lot of things, people still do harm, and I think that yeah, I wonder if there is a world where it will not be used to create harm. But I also wonder if there are more things than we can that we can do as a community. Um, to embrace like ethical ways of using stuff to make sure that we don't build harmful um, tools, essentially, or tools that can be used for harm, because we won't always hear in the news about how they're used for harm um, until it's too late, essentially. Yeah. yeah, I think from my end, maybe just a quick note, I think uh, one really, okay, well, one helpful thing would be, because we can also have a conversation about that, of course, during lunch later, but I think that one helpful thing that we probably need to think about is really being very cautious and very strategic about what are we feeding AI. Because if we, I can imagine the world in which we creating AI systems that are very much powered by good ethical frameworks, by licensed work which, which is credited, right? Where we actually understand exactly why does it look like this and what are the kind of connections that are being made in there. Like if you have a proper ethical framework that actually is designed from the start to make the world better rather than just efficient, right? Because I think that there is a big difference, right? We, we all focus very much on productivity, I think, at this point, and 
uh, getting faster, getting better, getting great results, wasting less time and so on. But that's only one part of the story. I think like, this is the other part that we actually need to bring in, in there. And maybe we'll get incredible results. I mean, maybe I'm just being too naive and hopeful here, but that's my thought. I mean, I stole your answer. No, no, it's a, that's a perfect answer. No, I, was, I just want, was going to say that money is flowing into AI. That's, that's a fact uh, for several reasons. Uh, Pablo mentioned that NFTs are not a thing anymore. Uh, yeah, that's actually a reality. Um, my only thing would be I hope those companies that are getting the funds put it into open source and design. I think these are the two things that we need now, like making sure this uh, remains open source and making sure we make, uh, we, you know, we make uh, valuable experiences for people. Like it could be companies, it could be uh, individuals, it could be uh, communities. But um, yeah, I agree with you. Like most of the things that are out there today are not really adding value or that much value. You know? um, so yeah, let's see. Excellent. Well, we're running out of time. We could probably speak for like another 62 hours uh, on the topic. Uh, but please give a warm round of applause to Ivan, Ariel, and Pablo for joining us. Excellent. I think we're going to continue conversations, um, but I think, at Paolo, maybe you, you want to come on stage and say a few words before we break out into lunch. Hey, for Pablo, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Go and join the. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up now. Please, uh, oh, sure. I would lo I'd love to have you uh, relax. You know, seated uh, there. Let's uh, get this out of the way. We're going to do the closure. This is, this is the time, you know, where the event is, is really, really coming to an end. So um, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Vitali. OK. This is, this is unopened. OK, good. <laughs> so um, this was uh, Pemput Fest. Um, we really hope that you, uh, you enjoyed it, that you learned something, that you met new people, you, know, you found exciting projects, you had a great time, you had also great food, enjoyed the venue, the company. Uh, and uh, this is the end, uh, unfortunately, but we wanted to make sure that we were building something uh, new, unique, different, Acting, as someone was saying, kind of a glue also for different open source communities around open source and design. And I think it resonated, all those values, uh, with you, with the speakers, uh, people online joining. So it was a great experience for, for us. It was two months, really, of very hard work. I hope it paid off, and I want to really welcome the community team uh, on stage. Great, 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 great. Oh, no. Uh. So, Viva Pento Fest! Viva Pento Fest! Viva Pento Fest! Thank you. One last housekeeping rule, uh, if you can, we're going to have the, the lunch there, but we will be putting a QR code here. You can scan it and you will get to a feedback form. Feedback is great, you know, uh, please share your, you also have that QR code or some link uh, in your emails. But, you know, you can already do that uh, during lunch. Thank you so much. <laughs>